I'd love to get going on a good note here. I got to send a fabulous text message to some information that I got today from Frank Wright. Uh, he's in the he, he he he's in the Hamptons right now. You see, all courtesy of David Tepper. Oh, and by the way, how you doing, Big Sills? That's right, man. What a week! <laughs> the comedy tour was awesome this week. Thank you very much, Philadelphia Eagles. That ass clown Sirianni gave me a ton of content. Wow. And the people that have been supporting him, this has been glorious. You know, I actually hear people saying that Nick Siri Clowney <laughs> is the best coach in the NFC East. And why did they fire his entire staff and have him on the hot seat if he's the best coach in the NFC East? None of it makes sense. Hey, listen, if you want to get into the building and you want to be cozy and cuddle up with the Eagles, that's the way to do it. Next, my guy. Holy cow. Hey, nobody is the best when their ass is on the line and they're going to get fired and they're on the hot seat and they're the number one guy who's going to be fired next year. How the frick can you say that? McCarthy's won a Super Bowl. Um, Dan Quinn, who was just hired, has done as much as that ass clown has done in Philly. And he's not even really a great head coach. He took a team in the Atlanta Falcons to the Super Bowl, and he's a hell of a coordinator. One thing Nick's not, a hell of a coordinator. So how is he better? Well, his record. Well, then how do you almost get fired? It doesn't make sense when you say that. Three straight playoff years. Look at his win percentage. Then why was he going to get fired? Because he's a great coach? Like, do you think Brian Dable, would you take Brian Dable or Nick Sirianni as a head coach to develop Jalen Hurts? Should he beat Jalen Hurts? With who? Tyrod Taylor and Tommy DeVito? He beat him with Tommy DeVito and Tyrod Taylor. Your fabulous quarterback. Come on, man. I mean, McCarthy's won a Super Bowl. Um, Quinn's been to one and took the Falcons to one. The Falcons. One of the best coordinators. Is he third? Probably. Okay, yeah, probably. Is he better than Brian Dable? I don't know. I could make the argument he's the worst coach in the East. Okay. Hey, um, Tone, bottom of the hour, by the way. Ron Jaworski's going to join us. Um, if you could, If you can reach out to him. Send me the contact numbers. We're sending you the link. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them we're sending the link. Um, we are sending. And I know you did already, Tone. So yeah. I mean, come on, man. Yep, we should have the email link now. Okay, good. Ron Jaworski will join us at the bottom of the hour. We will have Tone at 3.30, Merrill Reese at 4.30. The legendary Philly Godfather will join us. That'll be at 5.30. I got a couple questions. I can't wait to get Jaws on here. And I've got a couple questions that I would like to ask Howie Roseman. If I was sitting in one of those scrums, I would really love the opportunity to sit here and ask him a couple questions. Here's what I would ask Howie Roseman. By the way, we're going to look at some of the big issues that the Eagles are going to have this coming offseason here. Okay? I mean, this is my questions for Howie. 
And I would say this to you. Okay, do you remember that time during the season, Howie, when Nick Sirianni said that don't blame Brian Johnson, blame me, it's my offense? Well, I would ask Howie this question. How did, how did Nick survive? And the assistant coaches, they took it in the shorts and were given pink slips. How did Nick survive? And the assistants, which he said all year, don't blame them, blame me. How did he survive, Howie? How did that guy survive that all year long? Am I right, Tone? Did we not hear that all year? Hey, don't blame Brian Johnson. Don't blame him. Well, why did he why did he get the pink slip? I mean, how about this one, Howie? What led to the collapse? What led to the collapse of you going one and seven? What led to the collapse? Can anyone say it? What led to the, does anybody know that? What led to the collapse of one and seven at the end of the year? Isn't that a fair question to ask somebody? Since you're so confident that you bring him back and you've changed out the entire staff, why can't someone just ask the simple question? What led to the collapse? Has anyone answered that? At the Novacare Center, what led to the collapse? Has anyone asked that question? These are just simple questions that have not been asked yet. Why are you so confident in Nick? Howie, why are you so confident in him? He's the worst coach in the NFC East. I don't have a problem saying that. Every other coach has done more with less than what that guy has been given. By the way, how he didn't pick those players, he had nothing to do with them. That's all really good football players that have been on the Eagles. He parachuted into this thing. Those players are more of a result of the 11 wins instead of the shitty coaching. Remember, with him in charge of the coaching and him in charge of the offense, he's 13 and 12. When Shane Steichen was in the building, it was a different football team. He's 13 and 12. Come on, man. How about this question, Howie? Did you see enough, did you see enough of a development from your 2023 draft that you're happy with it? Did your 2023 draft develop last year into being players that contributed? Shit, I'll even do this. Hey, Howie, did your 2022 draft, did they develop enough to help your football team? What would you guys look at the last two years and say when you look at the draft? Have they developed those guys? Do you think the Eagles have developed their last two drafts. Have they? Who? Who have they drafted that they've developed? So you're telling me in two years, what's this? Maybe Cam Jurgens? Maybe Cam? How about this one? Hey, Howie. Will Kellen Moore play to Hertz's ability and bring out the best in Hertz's ability? You know, less running the ball, less RPOs doesn't really fit to what his skill set is. The further you get away from Hertz, I can't wait to talk to Jaws. Okay, I really, that'll be at 2.30 coming up here. And how he sees this.
Hey, Howie, what's your blame? Does he have any blame in this? I haven't heard him say anything. What's his blame? Will more maximize Hertz's ability? What led to the collapse? Why are you so confident in Nick? I think that question may have been asked. Did your 2023 draft picks develop? I mean, all but one of those questions haven't been broached by the Philly media. Why? Why? What, what, why haven't you asked any of these questions? And really, the most important question on this list here is what led to the collapse. How can a team that was 10 and 1 fall apart like that so dramatically? It was like a midair crash. Flying along, flying along, things are going well, the plane just blows up. It just blew to smithereens. I mean, <laughs> Tell me this. Once again, how did Nick Sirianni survive and his assistants didn't? How did he survive? Why did he survive when he said it wasn't their fault all year? I'm kind of confused on that. They blame the other people when the guy all year long told us, all year long, told us it wasn't Brian Johnson's fault what happened to the team. He could say whatever you want, man. Totally at the end of the day here, they were looking for scapegoats. They were going to do whatever they wanted to do in the offseason anyway. And now you know what you got? You know, you know, you know, you know what you have? You have people being talked into this coaching staff, into these coaching moves, and that you're okay with them. Won't matter. Won't matter. I don't give a shit if you hire Bill Belichick to coach your defense. You don't have enough good players, and I'm not confident you're gonna pick them up in the draft. The only way they're gonna actually continue what they do is by going into free agency. And you really don't have the money there. You really don't have the dog. You really don't have the money there. I got a bunch of questions here that we're going to, questions that I think have to be answered. Okay? They said they wanted to keep some familiarity of the team the last three years, and the success they have had instead of a complete redo. It is a complete redo. Dave, it's a complete redo. What are you talking about? They've, been, they've changed the entire coaching staff on both sides of the ball. You're going to have a complete different philosophy when it comes to coaches that are going to coach and develop. You may have the same formula that you're going to run on defense, that you're going to run on defense, but pretty much you're going to do the same shit you've been doing the last couple of years. Every two years, you're going to retool your team. I mean, look, guys, once again, I'm just looking for answers. What happened? Isn't that the craziest comment you could possibly make? And it's the simplest question to ask. Hey, Nick, Howie, what happened? Why can't you be that direct? Or do you have to really snow cone these questions for these guys because they get butt hurt that bad? Damn, dude. Really? Come on, Bob. Let someone ask a decent question. What happened? I don't think that's over the top. What happened? San Francisco broke you? Then you weren't a championship medal team. Jesus, Joseph. If that's the case, they broke you, 
you were never going to win shit anyway. Teams get beat. Teams get killed. San Francisco got killed by the Bengals and the Ravens, and they're in a Super Bowl. Teams get killed. Hey, you know this? When the Eagles got killed by the Niners and the Cowboys, I wasn't really, like, wobbling that much on it because they had beaten Kansas City and Buffalo, who were playing good ball. One was the defending champion, and by the way, is back in the Super Bowl. You had some quality wins to counter the massive losses that you had between San Fran and Dallas. That's a normal NFL season when you're playing high-quality teams. Sometimes you get the shells. Sometimes you get the egg. So, But when you get killed by Seattle and you get beat by Arizona, and then you get beat by the shitty Giants and run off the map by the Bucks. What happened? Like, how did you lose to Arizona and New York? Wait, ask that question. What happened in Arizona and New York? How come the team was not motivated to play? Like, Tony and I were talking yesterday. Dude, championship teams, they lose two or three Possibly four games you go, shit. But you don't lose six or seven and go, yeah, we were a medal team and we were a Super Bowl contending. Actually, think about it. You were never a Super Bowl contender, even at 10 and 1. Super Bowl contenders don't lose six or seven in the back end of the season. Most teams get better by the playoffs, not worse. You were in reverse. Get this. You want to hear this? If you ended the season like you started the season, I would have said you were a Super Bowl contending team. But the way you ended it, you were never. Because most good teams get better towards the end of the season. Not you. Okay? Not you. Not you. Oh, by the way, I was really glad to see my boy Josh Allen finish second in the MVP voting. <laughs> Took a team with one guy on it, finished second in the MVP voting this year. Good job, Josh. Good job, Josh. And by the way, with the NFL honors, I voted him number two also. So that was cool. Love to see that. Congratulations to you. Absolutely. Ron Jaworski will join us at the bottom of the hour from the NFL Network, and we're going to have a bunch of questions to ask him. And again, these are going to be questions that I'm going to throw off of you later on after Jaws is off with us. But, I mean, plus we're going to take a look at some of the college Talent that we're going to look at. And by the way, we're going to do the entire draft, not just the first round. The 22nd pick, um, the second round, the 50th, the 55th pick, the third round pick, the four fives, and the sixth. And we're going to go all the way down the list. Okay? Go all the way down the list on some of the players that they could take. We took the top 250 guys, okay? We took the top 250 guys that you could possibly draft in the upcoming NFL draft. You know, I would even make a comment. And the questions that I'll have for Jaws are going to be, like I said, the questions that we're going to ask you here in a minute here. I mean, but some of those questions that I would like to just have a question for Howie. And you know what? I'm gonna add, I'm gonna I may even start the interview off with Jaws and say, what happened? What caused the collapse? What caused it? Slagger says, Sills, they asked Sirianni what went wrong. He gave some bullshit about stale and how. We all had 
a hand in it. Hey, did you see what Jason Kelsey said on his podcast about the Eagle offense? Have you seen it? Have, have you heard it? Tone, have you heard it too? Have, have you guys heard it? Have you heard what he said? I, I got it. This is pretty interesting here on, on what they said. This was on the... Um, Chargers and Cowboys offensive coordinator and the boys with offensive coordinator Brian Johnson and have hired former Chargers and Cowboys offensive coordinator and the Boise State stud Kellen Moore. Have you met Kellen? I have not. Me neither. Played against him a lot, obviously, when he was in Dallas. I was surprised actually when he got fired the one year in Dallas. It felt like their offense was pretty f- good. Even just like two years before that, he's being touted as head coaching uh, candidate, one of the top ones up there. He's been one of the brightest minds for young offensive coaches for some time now. There was a lot of people, and I think looking back ourselves, that realized that we could have potentially been a little bit more creative, I guess, offensively. And I think Kellen will bring a lot of that. He did it in Dallas. He's basically saying, he's basically saying that the Eagles were stale offensively. That come, that's coming from a guy who's been that who who's been supporting Nick Sirianni saying, hey, um, we were we were a little vanilla last year. Stale. Isn't that the word he used in the press conference? Right? Stale? And he survives. Okay? (laughs) All year long, once again, we heard that it wasn't Brian Johnson's fault. It's his. Okay? It's his offense. And yet, the assistant coaches took it in the ass. Okay. Dan, you see Kittle destroy Aiden Hutchinson? Um, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, Teresa goes, what happened to Barrett after the show? He lied. No, he didn't lie. How do you know he lied? Why, because a player at the Eagles walked something back? They've been walking shit back all year. I don't believe Barrett Brooks lied. Sorry, Teresa. I 100% and 1,000%. By the way, I actually heard Jeff Kerr on one of the shows say that Jalen Hurts, tell me, and, and don't, don't let me go too far off the reservation on this paraphrasing here, that the Eagles have made it, um, and maybe Hurts' people have made it. It's not that he's not approachable. Maybe not ex- n- n- not. He, he, he's he's not open when it comes to being and having a lot of people around him any longer. They get, I, I think they've gave less access, right? Am I right, Tom, when I said that? Less access to Hurts. He's not as accessible. You know, one thing Boomer Sison said on this program a couple months ago is that when players get paid big money, they have to learn how to play with the contract as well. And Boomer was right. I think there's a lot of pressure. There's a ton of pressure when it comes to this. There is a ton of pressure when you play and you have that kind of money put on the table there. Okay? So, hey, man, I'll tell you what. One of my favorite people on the planet, and I remember going back with Steve Sable, God, you know, one of the greatest things that I ever had was my relationship with the Sable family and NFL films. And this goes back before I bring Jaws on, because Jaws is around all the tape that they have down there at NFL Network. And I remember being and setting up cones at the Yale Bowl when the Giants played at the Yale Bowl. And there's Steve Sable and his dad putting all these camera guy angles on. And Jaws has been in that building for such a long time. It's one of the most iconic places in NFL. 
You got the NFL Hall of Fame and you got NFL Films. I think they're both Hall of Fames. Here's Ron Jaworski with the NFL Network. He joins us now. Damn, Jaws, that must be so awesome to be around Fort Knox at the NFL every day. Pretty much, Dan. Great to be with you once again. But it, it, NFL Films really is the heartbeat of the National Football League. And we television does a magnificent job. But the, the close-ups, the sound, the visuals presented by NFL Films and started with Ed and Steve Sable, now Ross Kettle is doing a great job of leading NFL Films. It humanizes the game. You know, we all know it's a tough, physical, nasty game to play, but it humanizes it. It brings the, the passion into our living rooms, into our homes, into our, on our TV. So, um, you know, 28 years having my office in NFL Films was every day but it was an honor to go to work uh, and be with the great people of NFL Films that make the league such, such a special place. Joss, let's get into Philly and let's get into the Eagles. Your first thought when there was a possibility that Philadelphia was contemplating potentially moving on from Nick Sirianni and obviously eight days after or nine days after they decide to move forward with Nick. Were you shocked? Were you not shocked? Just give us your impressions on the overview of what you saw that whole time as they were evaluating the coaching staff. No, I was not shocked at all. I, I, I was, I, I, quite honestly, I wasn't even really concerned about Nick Sirianni's job. I, I think overall he's done a fantastic job. Um, people remember the, the, the latest, and it wasn't the greatest, um, but you got to look at the full body of work of Nick Sirianni. Three years, uh, 34 and 17, a Super Bowl appearance in the second year. No question, it was a colossal collapse after the 10 and 1 start, going to 1 and 6 down the stretch. But uh, I think things need to be addressed. And they were. Uh, I have unbelievable respect for Jeffrey Lurie. I, I think he's one of the most conscientious owners in the National Football League. Uh, he doesn't make knee-jerk decisions. He's thoughtful of everything that he does in regards to his football team. Uh, he's a great owner. Uh, so I, I knew he would be thoughtful in his conversations. And I'd probably say the same about Howie Roseman. You know, I mean, Howie Roseman has built a really good football team. Um, yes, there was a collapse. There's no doubt about it. And corrections need to be made. And they have been made already. The new coordinators on each side of the football and a lot of the system coaches being dismissed as well. So um, I think the Eagles knew that changes needed to be made, but they weren't the head coaching position. What do you make of the new coordinators? And, Jaws, before I go on with uh, Vic Fangio, let me, let, me, let me say this about Kellen. You know, Kellen, he did run RPOs when he was in San Diego or excuse me, in Los Angeles with the Chargers. And, but when I'm, when I'm thinking about him in Dallas, man, Dak's more like McNabb than he is more like Mike uh, Jalen Hurts. And I'm thinking, what, RP, what, what kind of dual threat experience does he have? Or does that matter, Ron? Do, do guys adapt like him and they adapt to the talent that they have in front of them? How does that work with a guy like Kellen Moore when he's most – been around drop back guys, not really dual threat guys. Well, I, I, I'm a big fan of Kellen Moore. I think wherever he's been, he's done a good job. Uh, he was a tremendous collegiate quarterback at Boise State. Um, you know, he knows how to play the position, he's played the position, so he has a feel for it, what it's like to be in that pocket when bodies are flying around and the movement that it takes. And I, I know, Dan, I've been with, with you on your show a number of times. I am not, I am not a proponent of running quarterbacks. I think you should run when you have to. I do not like teams that design plays for the quarterback to run. And not that they don't help your football team, but they get hurt. And I think the, the, the most important player to keep on the field health-wise is your quarterback. And, uh, you know, I think we saw the, a little bit of decline in Jalen Hurts because of the, the bumps and bruises he's had. And he hasn't been the same quarterback he was three years ago. None of the guys are. When you get hit in this league, you did it for a long time. You know what it's like. They don't get to the quarterback and say, Oh, let's wrap him up gently and set him nice on the ground. <laughs> no, that's not what, what you do. You want to bend the face mask, puncture your lung, break his ribs. That's how the defensive players look at the quarterback. They want to hurt the quarterback. So I do not like coaches that design plays to put the quarterback in harm's way. Now, that doesn't say there aren't opportunities in the course of the game, big play time, where you, you have to do it. And I'm okay with that. But I don't want to see my quarterback have 10 or 12 design plays and RPOs and all these things fancy, you know, high school Harry type plays that guys want to run. I am so a big believer in the physicality of football. The team that wins in the trenches usually wins football games. So 
Uh, Kellen's not going to bring a lot of the fancy running quarterbacks, zone reads, and all these other things and get Jalen outside the pocket and get him hurt. Jalen was not the same running quarterback he was this year that he was the previous two years. How about this, Ron? You, do you believe then that the Eagles hired Kellen for what they think and want him to be instead of what he is? Because you know this, quarterbacks, when they get into games, they go back to their comfort zone, which is running. And so is it because to me this last year, you know, he had the highest percentage of harder throws. He was blitzed the most of any quarterback in the league this past season. And it just became to me that they were morphing away from 22, which got him to be the second runner up to the MVP. So I would say to you, Ron, are they trying to adjust his game? Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a fair word. I think you got to be careful how you make that adjustment. Uh, and go back to what I said a moment ago. I, I think the physical nature of football means you have to run the football more. And sometimes we get caught up with the shiny objects, you know, and hey, we got AJ Brown, we got Devontae Smith, we, we got, you know, we got all these weapons, you know, we got to use the weapons. When to me, those weapons become more valuable when all of a sudden the safety starts cheating down because you run the football. Weak safety, strong safety, linebackers taking a step forward. Once you get those linebackers and safeties cheating up toward the line of scrimmage, Oh, my God, you open up the middle of the field with a big passing play. So I think you must be a, a, a two-dimensional balanced offense and dictate the terms of engagement through the defense. If you don't do that, he's going to sit back. They're going to they're rush five. They're going to rush six. Play everyone else in coverage. And that's going to be much tougher to be, to be in complete passes down the field. Tell me, Ron, the relationship between Nick Sirianni and Callan Moore. Are you more concerned about the relationship with Kellen Moore and Jalen or Kellen Moore and Nick? Because, hey, hey, Ron, you know, anytime a head coach, and we, and I'm not going to use the word demoted, but he was hired initially to be a play calling head coach. This is what he was hired for. And when he's had the offense, if you look at the two and five start, and this last year, he's 13 and 12 when he's had the offense in his hands and not Shane Steichen's hands. So I would ask you, I go, will that be a conflict? Isn't that also a relationship that people have to keep an eye on, on how that dynamic's going to work? Yeah, and I think it's more of an evolution, uh, the way Nick has, has, has evolved as a head coach. I think initially he did call for about seven or eight games before Shane Steichen took over. He did call the plays. Um, and, and, and right now, if you see it around the league, there's a, Two schools of thought in this. You've got some coaches that want to call the offensive and defensive plays. You have some that want to be, I will call them, develop the culture. And, and, and I, I think as the game has gotten bigger and the time uses of head coaches now, I think I lean more toward developing the culture. Everyone says, well, well he doesn't call plays. He doesn't run the offense. Well, what, what, what's he do? They have no idea. I mean, you, and I li- you and I lived it. You're putting in, these coaches put in 18 to 20 hours a day a day. They sleep in their office. They put the time in developing not only the football team, but the culture of the football team. And by the way, the culture of the organization, because when you talk about culture, the culture means from the owner on down, from the owner, the GM, to the president of the organization, to the scouts, the people that are working all the college games and working, you know, uh, physically going to college games. What is the culture of the team? And, and a lot of that is dictated, yes, I think number one by the owner, number two by the head coach, because he's also becomes the face and voice of the football team. So I think I'm okay with Nick Sirianni developing the culture and building this football program, not being demoted, say, from a play caller. I, I think the league is going more toward getting a, a head coach that develops the culture. How about this, Ron? Why such a change when it comes to the coordinators? A year ago, they hired guys with no experience, basically. And this year, all of a sudden, it's even the position coaches that you see coming in. These guys are 10-year, 20-year-plus guys. I mean, <laughs> maybe you've got a sense of urgency. You know what I thought about this last night, Ron? How much is that playing into February when you're late, when your coordinators get taken away from you? How much does that play a factor that, you know, I mean, especially when a guy gets plucked, Vic goes to, he goes to Miami, maybe the side was the third choice. You don't get enough assistance. You really don't have enough time because OTAs are on top of you right away. And they're right there. This is a, tw- hey, when you and I had six months off, we could go get fat somewhere on a fat farm and we could sit there and eat and drink. Now it's a 12, 24 7 deal. 
And you were probably, hey, you were probably working at a bank somewhere. I was working at a pizzeria. All right. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, how much did that play a factor? And like, it's such a dynamic change. No, it, it, it is a change. And some of the changes have been, been good, in my opinion. Some of it has been negative, in my opinion. But um, if, if you think about offensive coordinators around the National Football League over the past two years, two years, every team has changed their offensive coordinator. Every single team. And the national 32 teams in the past two years have changed their offensive coordinator. I don't know what that number is on the defensive side of football. I'm working on that, but I know the offensive side, it's been a new play caller. So not for long, as we've heard from the NFL, not for long, you better be productive or changes are made. And, and, and the game just keeps evolving. And, and I actually, your first question I'll answer first, I, I, I did not like inexperienced coordinators coming out, which the Eagles did last year. I, I'm a big believer in wisdom, a guy that's been through it. You know, and, and, and Brian Johnson's a great guy. I've had a great relationship with him, fell on the side, great guy. But once you get thrown into the fire of calling NFL offense and defense, you know, if you have a little experience or no experience, it is a hard job. So I think the Eagles have learned from using inexperienced play callers to going out to more experienced play callers. Vic Fangio was one of the best defensive corners in all of football. You know, I, I, I don't care what anyone says about what happened in Miami. They had a pretty damn good defense in Miami with a lot of players hurt last year. I don't know what the reasons were, why there's a parting of the ways. But I know this, Vic Fangio can flat out coach. He's been in his business since the early 80s here in Philadelphia with the stars of the USFL. He's got some of the best defenses around the National Football League. He knows how to coach. He knows how to call defenses, and his schemes are sound and simple for the players that play in them. I'll tell you what, Ron, I heard people belly aching and crying in Miami. You know what I told everyone? Good. I go, listen, man, you finally got a coach that's going to hold people accountable. Amen. And some of those Amen. guys Amen. down there Amen. don't Amen. like right it. Right. right, Ron? Some of those guys down there don't like it? Well, guess what? I don't care, man. I want a guy in here holding people accountable. I, you know, if you're not bitching, coach isn't doing his job, in my opinion. Yeah, like, me too. Seriously. seriously. If every, if every, oh, this is great. We don't work hard. Hey, everything else. We're, we're home by four o'clock. Hey, we love it here. I'd rather have guys who say, he's killing us. He's working us. We're meeting, we're meeting for three hours after practice. We got every detail covered. Not these guys hitting all the clubs down the South Beach, you know. But, you know, are they paying the price to be successful? Vic is old school in that regard. His defense and his players will be accountable for doing their job. And I think, I think that's the number one thing Vic will bring accountability. You know, you know, you know, Ron. I you 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 made the comment, and I'm with you. I don't like guys. As a matter of fact, I got a problem with the guy in Buffalo the way he runs too much because he's going to end up like Burt Jones. This guy keeps his stuff going the way he's running up there. Now they got a running back for him, and they're helping him more, and they're morphing more into that with Joe Brady and the underneath passes they're helping him. But when I watch Hurts this past year, here, here's what I look. If you want a guy to be the CEO of your company or you want a guy to date your daughter or marry your daughter, Jalen Hurts is your guy. Dual threat, for me, I tell you, I think you get too much inconsistency. First-year starter, second-year starter, third-year starter. You got three different guys, Ron. I mean, who is he? He's never going to be you're, – you're never going to be as great of a season that you had in your best year or you're never going to be as bad as your bad season. You're somewhere in the middle. Are you concerned about Hurts moving forward? No, I'm, I'm really not. I, I think Jalen, as you said, he is, he is arguably the hardest worker on the team. And I'm not just saying that because he's in Philadelphia and I know him. I, I know coaches that are with him every single day that I speak to on a somewhat regular basis that people in the organization that talk about his work ethic. And he's a hardworking guy. You know, we, we've, heard, we've heard the BS about a lot of quarterbacks in this league, first in, last out. Jalen is first in, last out. He does put the time in. But he's, there's some areas in the game, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be critical of he's, he's, he's At times, for me, is a slow blinker. He doesn't read the blitz very well. He doesn't read it quick enough. And it's a part of his game that he must be better at. You know, the, the loss of Tampa Bay in the playoff game, Tampa got blitzes home, the same ones they ran in 2021 in the playoff game. The same blitzes that worked in that 2021 playoff game worked this year. So, you know, it, I, I know he was prepared for him, but he didn't handle them well. The offense didn't handle them well. The best side adjusts weren't there. The hot principles weren't incorporated in, in, in the scheme. But but Jalen's got to be quicker. When he reads that blitz, the ball has to come out. When that foot hit, back foot hits on that set, the ball's got to come out. You can't bounce. You can't move. 
It's got to come out when things blitz. So that's why I say a slow blinker. You've got to process that information quicker when the blitz is coming. Do you agree? Bill, Bill Walsh told me this years ago, Ron. He said, you know, I go, man, Montana's got a great arm. He goes, no, he's got great feet. And I went like this, feet. He goes, the great quarterbacks don't drift to seven step. They get back so they can process. The great ones are processors. That's why you don't, you can be like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady and not be able to jump over a stack of quarters, Ron. But these guys get back into their seven step. They got great feet and tapping and staying in the pocket presence. When I watch Jalen, am I wrong, Ron, when I say this? He just seemed late on his throws. And I watched that Seattle game. He threw in a double coverage and he had Devontae underneath. Go to the easier throw. I mean, don't make the game harder than it needs to be made. And it just seemed that the offense was trying to get plus 25 plays and explosion plays, and those routes took forever to develop. It just looked like one-on-one -on -one to me. And again, it'd be, when you're in that mode and you watch 10 or 11 football games and you're a football player that plays in the NFL or a coordinator, you become predictable when you look at the at the catch ratio. A.J. Brown had 38 of the uh, – was 34% in targets, the most of the league. So after a while, you go like this. They're not throwing anybody else. It just became too predictable. Yeah, I, I think if, if there's a change I would make in the offense, it would be have a number of plays designed to read short to deep. And this is where the Kellen uh, Moore experience, I think, will pay off. You know, guys like C.D. Lamb, who really did great in that slot, quick balls coming off quick. The Eagles need to do more of that. I I, I believe, that, and, and I watch every game on Monday morning or whatever. I, I know you do. When I was, I'm looking at the tape because I, I want to see what happened. I hate to make comments based on watching just one player or two. So I like to see 11 on 11. And I, I thought there were too many times in, by the design of the offense where the ball wasn't coming out to the short, quick receiver. And I think there's more plays in the playbook to get the ball out quick, the three step drop thing. I think he needs to run a little more under center. So I'm giving all my breakdowns of the damn offense yeah. right now. Um, the only time he gets under center is for the push push, you know. But I think you need to, you, know, you, have, you need to be more under center because it gives you a better opportunity to run play action passing, and you have more runs available when you're under center than when you are under shotgun. So I think, you know, I think Kelmo can in and put a lot more quick passing game plays in the game plan within the offense. I think that will help Jalen because he doesn't have to. You know, you can face it. Everything reads deep, 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 deep. Safety corner reads. Well, why not read linebacker first? Why not read strong safety first? Let them dic dictate where the ball should go. But always have that short, quick pass to get the ball in. Now, as I said earlier, now the secondary starts cheating up, linebacker speed up, that's the attack down the field. couple last questions for you here, Ron. You know, we look at the recent hires. Majority of the hires were defensive coaches. And if you look at the league, scoring was down, and we didn't have a 5,000-yard pass, or even though we added – a game we didn't have that and it just seems to me that these coordinators now are just now starting to catch up with some of these high high gun offensive coordinators does that go in cycles you think and that's why we're seeing how about this too ron the 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 bend but don't break defenses now i don't know if you're ever going to see the ravens or the buccaneer type defenses of those defenses in the past because again because of salary cap you have a lot of turnover in the roster. Linebacker plays not as good as it's been in the past, so the tight end is becoming more proficient. Is it just really – it's not an eagle thing where we're looking at keep everything underneath, bend but don't break, control and contain, because that's what Fangio is. He's a control and contain guy. Is that a league thing, Ron, we're seeing more of? Yes. I, I think it's turning into a red zone league. I mean, we seen the 20s. Teams are getting yards, chunky yards, are getting plays. And the teams that are most productive in the red zone offensively and defensively are usually the teams that are going deep in the playoffs and the Super Bowl. It's become a red zone game to me. And that's, that's just the nature of the beast right now. Ron, what's different with Andy Reid today compared to Philly? And if it's just 15, okay, because, hey, 15 <laughs> going to make you look good. I get it, Ron. That guy's good. That guy's going to make everybody look good. But I don't know. I mean, again, we're, we're almost in the conversation again with Brady and Belichick. Now we're here with Reed and Mahomes, and we're having the same kind of conversation. I mean, look at all these AFC championship games. The kid's 28, and he's going for his third Super Bowl. He's getting in the room with Montana now. 
This is psychotic. I mean, and Andy's now with all these conference title games in a row. I mean, what's different about him today? Well, first of all, Patrick is in rarefied air. He is a, he is a tremendous talent. There's no question that. Um, he, and he, the thing that he he is best at to me is seeing the field. Uh, and and some, you know, we talk about quarterbacks, and you know, I study the college guys come in and, and try to get some sort of feel of how they're going to be around draft time. But vision is something we normally do not talk about when we talk about quarterbacks. Arm strength, speed, size. Can you see the field? Some guys have that myopic view, you know, through the telescope, and they can't see anything around them. I want the guy that sees the entire field. Those are the guys that are most successful. The vision is critical. I don't think there's anyone better in the league than Patrick Mahomes. Now, occasionally, he will dip his head. Occasionally, he will. And, and he, he will look for that lane job. But the minute he gets out, he's looking for that, that ball down the field. That's where explosive plays come. But he has a great he has great vision. He knows where his feet are. That's been the key to his success. Andy Reid is, is, to me, he's a, he's a, he's a football treasure. Uh, Andy is, you know, Andy's obviously going to be a Hall of Famer, but I just love the way he's adapted to today's players, today's offense, today's defense. And by the way, how, Dan, maybe you can tell me this, because no one's been able to tell me this. How does Steve Spagnuolo not get mentioned by all these moronic general managers and owners looking to hire a coach in this league? How, how can they overlook the career, yeah, okay, he had a bump in the road in St. Louis when he was the head coach 25 years ago. Didn't work out. Bad organization, bad leadership. Hey, he was a, he was a scapegoat. Get rid of Spagno. You look at the history of Steve Spagno, and if you know Steve Spagno, like I know a lot of people that do, and I know Steve was based in Philadelphia, there isn't a better X's and O football coach around than Steve Spagno. There, we can talk about Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, who's house at home right now. But they're in that Super Bowl on Sunday, next Sunday because of one guy. I mean, Steve Spagnuolo has redefined that defense and rebuilt that defense where the defense is not getting the chance to see. Yet eight coaching jobs are open. I don't hear Steve's name. I I, I just I, I don't get it. I I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why that you see Vrabel, Carroll, and Belichick not as a head coach. The reason it's not because those guys were passed over. You have now with the analytics departments. And you have a lot of these young guys, a lot of these organizations today, Ron, in my opinion, don't want to surrender personnel control. They don't want to surrender the hiring of assistant coaches control. The thing I heard from Rich McKay, and it was $28 million that may have played a factor, but he wanted to bring Scott Pioli down with him as part of the scouting department and the Atlanta Falcon people. Arthur Blank wanted him, but he was like, you know, and he wanted a higher bill. But Bill was like this. I'm no, I'm not in a position. I'm still getting paid money from New England here to take a job that I'm not going to have somebody drive me into um, an iceberg. And I think Steve Spagnola is in that category where, like you said, he's one of the greatest defensive coordinators. You'd put Wade Phillip. Wade may not be the greatest head coach, but Spags, look what he did with that defense. It's been remarkable. All the young players that he's implemented, it's been remarkable. I just think that he's in that tweener mode now where owners look at him and go, is he too old? Was he a good coach? He had a bump, like you said, which to me, I think coaches are better their second time when they get another job. I agree. Um, I, ju I, just, I just think that they're going more for the younger guy because, you know, Ron, and I don't mean this with any disrespect because I love Raheem Morris and guys like that. But at the end of the day, I just think it's they've got more control over the – entire organization when you have a younger player or a younger coach that's in that position. Well, now you Ray Morris, I'm glad he finally got another opportunity. You know, he, he's earned that opportunity. It seems like these guys seem to get overlooked for the next rising star, you know, whoever that may be. Um, I, I, I just think the, the head coaching job in the NFL right now, it's not just the X's and O's, you know. Oh, it's, completely. It's, when we talk about Nick, it's about developing that culture within the team. And it's hard to be a position coach and be – you know, leading an organization or calling plays and leading an organization. There's so much on the plate. You know, that's why I, I lean toward veteran, experienced guys. And you said it, the guys who knocked down a few times and grew up from those experiences. You know, not just, hey, I got beat and you throw in the towel and you quit. You get knocked down and you up in the fight. And there's a lot of guys with Fred Nolas, the Raheem Morris, that have that been through the battles, been knocked down and gotten up. And I, to me, those are the guys that deserve the opportunity, not some, some you know, some guys who can always be very creative, you know, and, 
he, you know, we got, he'll listen to our analytics guys how, or owners or owners. The owners want to run teams, you know, and let the coaches run the teams that hire effective, experienced guys to me. That's a, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. That would be my way. No, I got one last question for you, but to, to follow up on that, when they, when they hired the kid Callahan in Tennessee, I'm like, is that Bill Callahan, the old lineman? He goes, no, it's his kid. I'm like, his kid. <laughs> I was like, who is that? Well, let me guess. He was a quality control coach, worked in the analytics department, and now he's a head coach. Yeah. <laughs> That's Good not luck. putting your time Good in. Luck, yeah, yeah. I got I'm with you, Ron. Last question here. Ron, this is going to be a crazy – I started the rumor in Philly of trading A.J. Brown. Now, before you think I'm crazy, I want you to listen what I what we just talked about with Kansas City and with Jalen Hurts, and I'll, I'll tie it in here. Kansas City is in their second Super Bowl in a row without Tyree Kill. And he could win his second without him. They took all those resources and the $50 million that they paid him, put that in that side of the football, and opened up the window for Patrick Mahomes' Super Bowl window more because they run the ball and their defense got better. Look at Green Bay. Green Bay gets rid of Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. They get all those draft choices, Ron. They built that team up. Green Bay is trending up. My point is with these big-time wideouts that you're spending this money on, or even a quarterback, would you rather build your team? San Francisco has something going on, which is the freakiest thing I've ever seen. A quarterback can win the Super Bowl making $870,000 a year, and you're paying $50 million here, 25 million here. Ron, isn't it harder to find a guy like Mahomes and the needle in the haystack than to sit there and build up the integrity of your roster and have a competent quarterback like like Brock Purdy? Because Brock Purdy to me is maybe a little bit better version of Jimmy Garoppolo. Don't you have a better chance of building the roster up than finding Mahomes? Well, no, no question of that. I mean, I just, you're not going to find many Mahomes. I mean, it's, just, it's not there. There are Great quarterbacks in this league, probably five of them. You know, probably five you can count on week in and week out. Some may stretch a little bit, but you're right there. But, but to answer your question about A.J. Brown, I think absolutely not. I, I think you, when, when you look at this Eagles team, the way that they're going to win probably the next two, three years is going to be on offense. Their defense needs a rebuild. Linebackers, safeties, corners need a rebuild. They're going to have to outscore people. And maybe in, I would agree just a very little bit. Maybe getting more draft choice. You trade A.J. Brown. They can take a $42 million cap hit as well. Um, I think when I look at this Eagles team right now, the strength of their team is the offense. Offensive line is still very good. Excellent running backs. Excellent wide receivers. And A.J. Brown is part of it. They're going to have to win games 35-31 to me in the next year or two. If they're in the rebuild of the defense, the offense is going to have to carry on. And I think A.J. Brown is too critical of a piece on offense. I have to ask you one last question. Who wins the Super Bowl? Kansas City. Chiefs 49ers. Kansas City. Kansas City. Kansas City. So this kid wins his third. Uh, no, Andy Reid's going to win this. Andy Reid's winning. Not, not, not Patrick Holmes. The Chiefs are going to win. They win it because of Andy Reid, Steve Spagnola, and Patrick Holmes. Man, Ron, he's been to five now. He's been to five, and Philly fired him. He's in, he's in well, and, and that's kind of a little bit of a misconception. I think the, I think Andy wore out his welcome. He was wore out their welcome of Andy Reid. Um, I sensed it at the time. It was probably time. It was time for a divorce. And then within a half hour, Andy had a job. It wasn't. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, within a half hour, Andy had. Everyone knew how good he was. It's just it was time. I, I, don't, I, I can't say any more simpler than that. Hey, I, I, hey, Ron, Ron, what's his name? Tony Dungy told me. I go, so when the Bucks fired you and the Glazers fired you, he goes, he goes, you want me to tell you the truth? I go, yeah. He goes, okay. Polian was on the phone 15 minutes later and he goes, what do you need? And I go, and, and I was like, I just got fired 15 minutes ago. Yeah. And it, he goes like this. He goes, whatever you need, let me know. Yeah. He goes, you want us to pick you up tonight? Fly you in? He goes, no, let me guess. Cause you know, he was really tied into the community of Tampa at the time. He still is actually. Oh, and he goes, that. he's like 15 minutes. Ursay called him and he had a job waiting for him. 
man. If you're good, they will find you. <laughs> yes, they always do. Hey, Ron, thank you so much, my friend. I so appreciate your valuable time. You always find time for me, man. Thank you, my friend. You bet, Dan. Have a great new year and uh, good shoots on me next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Since I picked them, I got to root for them, right? Yeah, now you got to root by, for them. Hey, you know what, too? I'll tell you this. Um, You know, I love Randy Cross, and my boy Kevin Fagan and Michael Carter played there, but I'm going Kansas City, too. By the way, I did end my career in Kansas City in 1989. You did? I, li I like the teams that paid me. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. They didn't pay him. Oh, okay, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> hey, thank you, Ron. I appreciate it very much. All right, thanks, Dan. Great thank you, Ron. You, That's friend. Ron Jaworski. Right. Yes, absolutely cool, man. Yes, I appreciate Ron coming aboard, man. What a great legendary player for the Philadelphia Eagles. I think he started, if I'm not mistaken, I think he started in Miami. Okay. Didn't he start in Miami? All right. Our boy Tone's going to join us. That'll be at 3.30. Meryl Reese will join us at 4.30. The legendary Philly Godfather will join us at 5.30. Hit the like button. Keep it here. National Football Show. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. You know, I, I, I was listening to the sports take guys before me, and they were talking about Sidney Brown potentially being a good football player for the Eagles. Well, does he fit? How can you have a non-aggressive defense and an aggressive player and think that meshes? You know why sometimes he was out of position? Because that defense is not aggressive. He's an aggressive football player. He's got to change his game to fit their defense if he's going to make it. 
You watch film on him. Everything he does is aggressive. Runs to the ball, his tackles, his hits. It's all aggressive. There's not one thing they do aggressive on that defense. So where does he fit? Does he fit in a Vic Fangio bend but don't break defense when he's a guy who likes to break and bend people over? How's that fit? How's that fit? Again, is he on the right team? You know, you, you're, you're telling me he's a good player. I think he is too. I think he's got potential. He's got 10 times more potential than Nicobe Dean does. But at the end of the day, does he fit? He get, get this. Think about it. You don't play an aggressive defense. You don't blitz. You play cover two. You don't let anything deep. You keep everything underneath, and it's all check down shit. That's not aggressive. And he's an aggressive player. Interesting to see how that dynamic works out. I, I got a great feeling that Sidney Brown's going to well, – okay, well, does he fit the defensive scheme? Everyone's got to fit. And one of the things that Hassan Redick ha had problems with in his three prior stops or his two-way, Arizona, Carolina, and then Philly. Okay, two prior stops. What was it? He didn't fit. He didn't fit their defensive schemes. They couldn't figure out what to do with him. What, is that just isolated to only Philly that everybody fits? Oh, yeah, of course it does. How dumb can you be? Not every player is going to be in a system that is conducive to their skill set. Didn't you watch your quarterback this last year? It applies also with safeties, linebackers, edge rushers, receivers. Okay. Again, it's a control defense containing control. It's not really an aggressive style defense where you see massive blitzing. And by the way, we saw massive blitzing on your quarterback and they took you apart in the last two and a half months of the season. And you're hiring a coordinator who is counter productive to what you saw your quarterback not being able to handle. Okay. I mean, Hey, I don't know today if it's going to work or not. I don't know. I, I don't, I have no judgment on it yet until I see some of the pieces that you put around Vic. But last year, your quarterback couldn't handle blitzes and they blitz the living shit out of them. Teams blitz the Eagles more than any team in the league. And you hired a guy who doesn't blitz. Okay. Fit. Help me out on this. You have no cornerback or no safety or no linebacker play, and you hired a coordinator who doesn't blitz. You must really think you have really great linebackers and secondary guys for you to have that mentality and be that cocky and believe that when you were last in the league in pass cover. How do you do that? How do you do that? You see what I'm saying when it comes to, how about this? I'm just talking out loud here with this. How do you tie that in? So you hired a guy that doesn't blitz, which means you're going to put more pressure on your corners and linebackers again. Okay. And you saw what the blitzing did to Jalen all year. Well, not all, well yeah, kind of all year. Here. By the way, again, Tone will join us at 3.30. Merrill Reese at 4.30. Philly Godfather, 5.30, will join us. Here are some of the questions that I have heading into this offseason for your Philadelphia Eagles. Um, whose offense is this going to look like? Kellen Moore's or Nick's? I have a question with that, don't you? What's the offense going to look like? 22, 23, both? What's it going to look like? What's going to be the emphasis? What's going to be your identity? Maybe that's the better question. 
What's the identity of – what do you think the identity of the offense is? Going to A.J.? If you're going to A.J. and building your offense around one wide receiver, you don't have an offense. You don't have one. You don't. You become predictable. For a man that doesn't blitz, he was able to set the sack record in Miami. Correct, because his front four got home, unlike the Eagles last year. Okay, is that your answer, Dirty D? They didn't blitz. Their front four got home. You didn't. Uh, is, is that what you're looking for? For a guy who didn't blitz, okay, they broke the Miami Dolphin sack record, okay? Yeah, because their front four got home. Is, is there some secret message there? What's the message? He, didn't, he doesn't blitz. You didn't have a front four that got home this year. You had no front four. You had no sacks. You had no pressure. Actually, your defensive line was even called out by Howie in the year-ending press conference. We didn't we didn't live up to our potential in the D-line. Okay? Once again, whose offense is this going to be? Knicks or Kellen Moore's? Here's another question I have. Will how we invest in linebacker spot, free agency, and in the draft? And how much? I think they'll address it. But how much commitment will they have behind it? How high? Here, let's make a prediction here. How high do you think Howie will draft a linebacker? Let's make a prediction here. By the way, we're going to have a little fun with that because I wrote down, guys, I think you'll draft all the way through the draft. We did the entire draft for Philly. What round do you think the Eagles will spend a linebacker pick on? What what round would you say? Second and third? Interesting. Hey, show, when's the last time the Eagles drafted a second round linebacker? I, I don't know. I'm not calling anyone out. I don't know. When's the last time they drafted a guy that was a linebacker in the second round? Can is is it been in the recent? Has it been in the recent uh, five years that they've taken a linebacker in the second round? Did did they take one in the last five years? Have they drafted a linebacker in the second round? No. Or, or I, I don't know really. No. The highest they have gone is third round. So my question is, will you go to the second round and take a gamble at linebacker, which you've absolutely shit the bet on for the last 23 years? With very, very, very select few that have been decent and good. You could you could count them on a hand in the last 25 years and linebackers you've drafted. You're talking to me about people in 2012 or people in 2007. Give me a break, guy. You haven't you don't have one player on that football team right now with the linebacker position that's worth a shit. Are you going to spend a second rounder or are you going to spend money? That's a question. 
Is that a fair question? I say this. We'll probably draft a linebacker in the fourth. Because, no, unless Howie was just talking shit at his press conference, which is probably what he was doing. You don't want to show your hand. I would give him so much more credit, too, if he does this. You know, if he does this come April, and this guy takes a linebacker in the first round, and he says we're happy with what we had in the press conference, good for you, man. You think Vic will get a say in the draft? I think Vic is going to get a say in the draft, 30D, because his assistant coaches are going to put a profile together of the type of player they need. Dirty D, don't ever think you got coaches that are in Philadelphia right now that have sat around and watched college football games. They don't. Here's the process. I've been in there and I've seen it. Here's the process. Scouts will come in to a meeting with the defensive coaching staff. And they'll sit in there with the defensive coaching staff with the personnel people. And this is the college guys. There's a meeting for this for the pro personnel as well. But the college personnel guys will come in and sit down, and they'll go position by position, and they'll go like this. What style of defense are you playing? What type of player are you looking for? What body type? What kind of um, athleticism are you looking for? And then what you'll do is, see, nobody cares about the names on the back of the jerseys when you're evaluating talent for an NFL coach. They're looking at profiles on who fits your scheme. What's the best avenue? Because most of the time, if you drafted a guy from, say, Texas Tech, and he played Mike Linebacker, he might be a completely different Mike Linebacker than what you're looking at if you go to Ole Miss. And the Ole Miss guy plays up on the ball. He's a great run stopper. He's good in pass coverage because he covers those great tight ends like Bowers of Georgia. And so you're looking more at that, and you're looking at the Ole Miss guy because you know why? That Mike linebacker covers these great tight ends that are in the Southeastern Conference, and he can play tight on the ball. Whereas Texas Tech, why does he play off the ball? Because the Big 12 throws the ball a ton. He may not be a good run stopper. He just may be one-dimensional. So what you're trying to do is find that balance when you're evaluating. And what they'll do is they'll come down and they'll show you five linebackers. And the linebacker coach will go, man, I really love this kid. Which is And get this, the coach will go, I love this kid. And the guy will go like this. He's projected as a fourth rounder. Oh, if he's there, you get him. Because that guy, that's what I'm looking for right there. You see that guy, the way he hits? The way he runs to the ball and the way his pursuit angles are? Look at his pursuit angles. That's a guy I'm looking for. And then you start putting your draft board together. You know, you start targeting players and profiles of players. And that, that's how you put your draft board together. Remember, this ain't about the first round, and that's it. Most teams are built from rounds three down, not rounds one, two. You're built from three down. You know, most of the superstar football players in the history of the league aren't first first round picks. Okay, they're later round guys. guys. Guys who got overlooked. So what you're doing is you're looking for a profile. Okay? I would say this to you. Again, what's the equity he's going to spend at linebacker? Okay? Personally, I think Howie Roseman is a horse. Here, name me two players that the Eagles have developed in the last two years that you drafted. Just two. How many picks has that been in the last two years? 10? Has that been like 10 picks? How many players have you developed into frontline good football players in the last two years? You're telling me that guy can draft? You ain't drafted one player. Now, I think Carter's going to have a great career. In the last two years, name me a player that they've drafted, that you've developed. The last two years. Mm -hmm. 
the last two years, the last two years, These guys are no factor on your team at all. Okay. Will Howie take a safety? Will he take a safety high in the draft? Or will this be free agent? Tell me this. How high is the last safety in the draft that Howie's drafted? So third round is as high as Howie has drafted for linebacker. What's the highest pick he's drafted at safety? How high has he ever gone there at safety? Third round, yeah, Sidney Brown. Okay? Sidney Brown. Yeah, you know, I, I, I made that comment about in the last two years is that any of these draft choices been a factor. And I thought about Devontae's first year. What a great rookie year he had. And uh, really, he was the only receiver you had. You think back on that first year. Man, you, you get this. That first year in that 980 or 69 yards, whatever he had, if he was in a decent offense that threw the ball and had a quarterback who was more established, I'm not ripping Hurts here. Hurts, that was his first year starting. Most first year starters aren't going to throw the ball like CJ Stroud. But I'll tell you something. If he was in that, he was in any kind of offense that threw the ball, he would have had Jalen Waddle's numbers. And remember something with Jalen Waddle. Tua was banged up. They were playing with Teddy Bridgewater, and they were playing with other guys down there. And he still had 100 catches. And he still had 1,000 yards. I mean, you just didn't really have a pass-happy offense back then in 2021. Okay? So, is he going to draft a safety? Probably not high. Fifth rounder? Because you know why? He won't draft another one? Because he believes that Sidney Brown's the guy. I hope he's right. I like the kid. If Lovey Smith saw enough of him, I think he's good too. By the way, he played with Devin Weatherspoon, who is on that conversation for the rookie of the year this year. He's in that conversation. I think Devin Witherspoon played his ass off in Seattle. And he was in that secondary, and I think another guy got drafted pretty high off that secondary that Lovey put there on Illinois. Um, will the defense be aggressive or the same? What do you think? You think Vic's going to be more aggressive or the same? Dakeem says Sidney Brown is the guy, but he's injured. Aren't they always? Lime. So you got Sidney Brown injured and you got Nicobe. Sounds like it's working. Um, you think it's more aggressive? I can't sit here and say on February 2nd. It won't be. I don't know. Okay? I, I don't know. Okay? I, I don't. He'll be better than Patricia. That I'm pretty sure he will be. Barb goes, maybe the same results. Maybe the same, but better results. You have to get more depth to get those results. Can't be worse than 12 yards off the ball. Kudos to you, senor. Very well put. Here's another one. Why is Howie getting a pass? Is he part of the collapse? 
I haven't heard that. He's part of the collapse too. He don't like to go in that boat and in that room. No, no, it's third. Because again, let's do this and go back again. Hey, it's not Brian Johnson's fault. Hey, it's not Sean Desai's fault. Hey, it's none of those fault. It's my fault. Yet the coaches that were fired were the assistants who the head coach says it wasn't their fault. But then the coach turns around and survives. It contradicts itself. The head coach said it's not the coach's fault. All year long and lied to you for six months. And then the two guys that get whacked are the assistants and he survives. How's that possible? How is that possible? It, it completely contradicts itself. It's not Brian Johnson's fault. How many times do we hear that? 20? Oh, in that Jets game, that was my call, not his. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was my issue when it came to the timeouts. Yeah, that was my call in that game, too. Yeah, that was my... How many times did he cover for Brian Johnson? Is he Was he lying again? Or no? I don't know anymore because I don't know what to believe with the guy. See, the problem that I have with Nick Sirianni is I don't believe him. And I don't trust him because he both face lies to you. It's not Brian Johnson's fault. It's not Brian Johnson's fault. It's not Brian Johnson's fault. And he gets fired. Okay, Nick, if it's your fault and you survive, how did the general manager feel that it was okay for you to survive? See, Nick's a product of the record the last three years. He didn't make that record. That's what the misconception was. By the way, what's more fraudulent, you think? The 10-1 and record or Nick Sirianni's record as head coach for three years? No coach with a record like that has to fight for his job, does he? Coaches that win four games fight for their jobs. Not coaches that have won and been to a Super Bowl fight for their jobs. What does that tell you? Even the owners and the general manager doesn't look at him and go, this guy had to fight for his job. You fought for your job and you're the best coach in the NFC East. Really? How's that work? How in the world does that work? If you're the best coach in the NFC East, you're the best coach in the NFC East, and you're fighting for your job. How? God, you guys are strange people, man. And you'll believe anything that's told to you. Well, look at his record, Sills. Dude, you're trying to tell me you think he's a better coach than Brian Dable. Brian Dable beat you with Tyrod Taylor. You think Nick Sirianni's putting a game plan together for Tyrod Taylor to beat you? Come on, man. How many people think that Nick Sirianni could coach Tyrod Taylor to a win? Come on, man. Or Tommy DeVito to a win. Shit, you couldn't coach... Gardner Mitchell a year ago, and he's in the Pro Bowl this year. Come on, man. Here's another question. What will the Eagles do with Reddick? What are you going to do with Reddick? You going to keep him? You're going to keep him? How are you going to play him? Going to drop his ass in coverage too? You're going to blitz him? Or are you going to do something that Jim Johnson did with Hugh Douglas? Actually make a position for the guy that's conducive for the guy's strengths. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with him? Makes no sense. Just to keep him. 
But then again, you don't have anybody rushing the passer. See, this is what I say to you about your guy and his record. You guys look at that record and don't look at championships, and that's why you've got one title in 30 years. Because you guys look at the consolation prize as a big deal. Who gives a shit if you're 6-10 and 10 or you're 13-4 and four if you don't win the Super Bowl? You're the same dude. You're at home. Now, one organization may be going in a different direction. You may have more optimism about the next couple of years heading in the right place versus not heading in the right place. But again, that's all projection. It has nothing to do with winning. Zero. Whether you're, whether you're, seriously, man, whether you're seven and 10 or 10 and seven, you're still home. You're still home. Hey, you know what's funny? The Philadelphia Eagles have the same record that the Chiefs have. We're the Chiefs. Fighting for another title. Getting ready to put another Lombardi trophy. Shit, let me see what Andy Reid has done already. How many Lamar Hunt trophies? By the way, the original owner of the Kansas City Chiefs, the AFC Championship trophies named after him. So he's brought to Kansas City one, two, three, four Lamar Hunt trophies to Kansas City and a Lombardi and two Lombardi trophies. Damn. And he's going for a third. That's awful impressive. That's awful impressive. You really think Nick Sirianni could take Tyrod Taylor and 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 beat the Philadelphia Eagles with him? Come on, man. Have some common sense about yourselves. At least try to think. All right, let's bring my guy Tone in. Tone, how you doing, my friend? There we go. Got it. How you okay. feeling? Okay, Derek Gunn and B. Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm pushing so many buttons back here. Sometimes got- <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Like a space capsule back there. For real. Dude, you know, it's funny to hear. It's funny to hear people here. Here, I'm I'm gonna gi- I'm gonna give you a bunch of questions. I started my show out with here. Let me do the Howie questions, and then I'll do what I just did here in a second. Um, what's Howie's blame in this? Ooh, that's uh, that's interesting. What's Howie Rosen's blame in this? Uh, well. He under he overestimated his defensive personnel. That was for one. Um, I think that was the that was the first the first misstep. Um, the rest of the missteps happened in season. Uh, thinking that Shaq Leonard was going to just automatically change the fortune of that linebacker room. Um, look, I admire the attempts though. You know, he tried to get Kevin Byer. He tried to. I admire the on the fly. Listen, we, we always a positive say, look. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. Yes. We, what we always say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So you got to you, you gotta take swings. So I'm never mad at a swing. But again, it goes back to the root of overestimating your defensive personnel. Obviously, we didn't anticipate the D-line falling off like that. That's the one thing I didn't account for. Yeah, me too. Um, I, think, I think that took everybody by storm. And I think... He he he! he I, I, that Sean decide decision really came back to bite them really badly. You know, Tone. It just seemed that this year he never gave himself any leeway. Like you're yeah. fixing the linebackers in season, you're changing the coordinator in season. All of that stuff was like, you know, usually a guy who was ahead of the game was playing from behind. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. just looked like to me his blame was it looked like he was playing from behind, and as I said, the jaws. You know, I think that February game being late like that, hiring mm-hmm. coordinators, and you know the personnel when it came to free agency, I think the Eagles weren't prepared for the off season. Yeah, it, it's it's funny you say that because I was thinking about what went into it, and you know the late start they got, 
And overall, it just seemed like they were behind one step behind every step of the way. And, you know, again, I just think the season has been plagued by a series of miscues and misevaluations. And especially and being, late. and being late. And, you know, sometimes you can't help it because, again, you were in the Super Bowl. So the, the whole coaching cycle pretty much passed you by. Don't you so, think that Kansas City was a little late and that's what caused them? Because you know why? The adjustment without the enemy, um, they had to get the new receivers going. They mm-hmm. were kind of behind, but they started rolling in the back end of the season. And they started getting it together towards the second half. I'll tell you what, Kelsey's playing the best football he's played all year in these mm-hmm. two games. Yeah, the so same thing with that kid Rice right Rice as well. Yeah, uh, that kid Rashi Rice, uh, that wide receiver yep. draft, he came on towards the end. He's it's funny. Up. It's funny for the when you think about the Chiefs situation, it's it's very, it's very similar to last season. Last year they was banking on young defensive players stepping up on the back end, and eventually they got there. Uh, this year they they were they were banking on young offensive players to step up, and eventually they got there, and and, and now they're back in the Super Bowl. Um, one thing I respect about the Chiefs organization that I wish the Philadelphia Eagles did more of is throwing their young people into the fire early. The, uh, the, I don't know what it is about the Philadelphia Eagles. I think 15 um, gives you that. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. Playing Patrick Mahomes gives you a lot you of, out of trouble. That's true. He gives you a lot of leeway. Yep. Um, but still, even then, um, I just feel like they didn't put Nolan Smith out there quick enough. Nolan, Nolan Smith should have been out there week one. Um, Sidney Brown should have been out there week one, not Terrell Edmonds. Um, you know, that Terrell Edmonds thing never made sense to me. It never made sense to me either. Um, Kelly Ringo, they should have found a way to get him on the field early. I just felt like they should have did a better job of trying to get the young guys ready in the event of anything. The only time they really put them on the field is when an injury happened and they were forced to put them out there. Had but, to. but like that doesn't to me, if I'm a player, that doesn't signify you trust me. That means that's that you're not just, player development either. Right. You're just putting me out there because yeah. You need, you, need you, you need the body. Yeah. But when you put me out there, if I'm a player and you put me out there early, day one, you give me some reps. That tells me, okay, yep. you're trying to get me going. You're trying, you trust you're me. Trying to develop me. You know what I mean? I didn't get a sense of that. So absolutely. And, let me uh, yeah, go ahead. Let me say something here before I move on here. Yeah. Do, do you agree with my assessment of Sidney Brown? Hey man, he's a really aggressive guy. And you're not in a very aggressive defense. You know, you're you're talking about an aggressive guy who aggressively tackles. He aggressively runs to the ball. He's an aggressive football player. Right. And that's not really what the, – it, it's control and contain kind of defense that Vic is. So, I mean, does is he going to fit? That's one thing you got to keep an eye on because not every player fits, Tone. Hmm. We may like the player, and I do. But does he fit what they're asking him to do? It's a fair question. Um, what, I, what I'll say to retort to that is um, Vic Fangio's – been in the league for as long as he has for a reason. And that's because he's shown an ability to adapt and, you know, revamp what everybody's been trying to copy. I believe you. Um, and so I say that to say, oh. I think he would be able to find a place for a guy like Sidney Brown in his offense, you know? And also look, the Eagles got to get younger on the back end anyway. They got to yep. get younger. They got to get more athletic. So I think a guy like Sidney Brown, that, that should be par for the course, that mentality should be par for the course. Again, I think a guy like Vic Fangio with his, you know, with his skill set, with his experience, he should have no problem being able to mold Sidney Brown to the player he needs him to be. How about this one? Will Kellen Moore maximize Hertz's ability? That's something I think about often. Um, here's my thing about that, because I speak about it all the time. As much as I love Jalen Hurts' current skill set, I think it's about time he starts expanding it, start adding on to it. Um, start to a step, you know, start to reestablish that pocket presence. Start Did he make to, uh, that leap this year on the, on the attempt to expand? Um, I'll say and, this: and, and hit, the results weren't what you wanted, though, Tone. But he did. He, I'll he say did this: leap to another part of a game that wasn't him, really. I I, I get what you're saying. I, 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 I'll I'll say this: he threw the ball more, right? And and was just as accurate. About he was he he was just as accurate now. Obviously, the turnovers are an issue, but 
when I see a guy with a lot of turnovers and then I see a 70% completion percentage like a Josh Allen, or if I see a 65% completion, completion percentage like a Jalen Hurts, I'm not saying, oh, they're not accurate. I'm saying, oh, they got to make better decisions. Yes. So that's so I think the decision making was off this year. The accuracy was still um above league average. Um, so when it comes to Kellen Moore, um, I'm looking to Kellen Moore to um help Jalen Hurts be more comfortable in that pocket, really utilize the entire football field. If you look at Jalen Hurts' pass chart from that playoff game against the Buccaneers, he threw maybe one or two passes in the you know in between the uh numbers. Hmm. Other than that, all his passes were on the boundary. That tells me that he's not comfortable, period. If he was comfortable throwing those passes, he would throw them, right? He doesn't see, he's not comfortable throwing across the I middle. He's not comfortable because he, he doesn't see the middle of the field. Do you think, now, 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 now let me ask you this. We don't really talk about, we don't, we don't talk much about this because it's something that can't change. But do you think his height has something to do with it? No, I'm going to tell you what happened. They rushed him. Here's what they do with great quarterbacks. Right. Even Mahomes, early in their careers, they roll these guys more. Why? So you can manage half the field from one hash to the sideline. Right. You're playing against the 12th defender over here called the, the sideline. So you can make a poor throw over here, go out of bounds, and all you have is an incomplete pass. Mm -hmm. You make that pass over the middle of the field, it's a pick in the NFL. So what they do is – let let get a chance. Montana did this. Everyone, Elway did this. They all rolled a particular way that they're comfortable doing. And you're looking at half the field. And then, Tone, as you get more comfortable seeing progression reading and you're starting to see more of the field, that field opens up more and you're more comfortable because you know where to go with the ball on pre-snap reads and you know what it looks like. So to me, what they did was they went from 21 to 22, and they saw that. Then they went from 22 to 23, and they assumed that, mm. that he was going to. And I think they really just didn't take into consideration this is a process. Right. Don't rush the kid. Mahomes is still being developed. Right. I'm willing to say, I'm willing to say when it comes to Jalen Hurts' development, um, as much as we look at his skill set and say, wow, you got to maximize and lean on that. If we're being completely honest with ourselves, if Jalen Hurts wants to last in his NFL and if he wants to really win big, he's got to win from that pocket. He does. He has to. Absolutely. And um, so, so you know, bringing in Cliff Kingsbury probably would have made more sense. But does that truly take him to the next level? And I think that's probably what their mindset was with Kellen Moore. Everything that Kellen Moore does well, Jalen Hurts struggled with. And I think that's something they looked at. And they look at it so as So they want to make him into something that they want him to be instead of what he is. You know, when you when you frame it like that, it's almost it's 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 almost as if they're being counterproductive. Like buyer's to the remorse. He he didn't get that money because of the player you want him to be. He got right. that money because of the player he is. I I hear what you're saying. Um, I think also that playoff game against the Chiefs, that Super Bowl game, when they saw him dealing from the pocket like that, I felt like that gave them this, this semblance of, whoa, he can do that? But okay, why, did, let's, why was he able to do that, Tone? Because there was the threat. This last right. year, they took the but, threat away. Right, right, right. So I think, so I think the threat should never disappear because right. at the end of the day, his, his athleticism is still his athleticism. The threat never goes away. That's but maximizing. It's, but it's okay. So it's so it's how it's being used. And I think Kellen Moore, while trying to add on to Jalen Hurts' game, I think the challenge is going to be how creative can he be to keep Jalen Hurts in a comfort zone while still growing exponentially. That's going to be the challenge. You gotta you've gotta light that thread again. Yeah. Be, dude, 22. I say this to you all the time. The thing that stuck out to me the most. Holy cow. That guy on third and 11, he's getting that. I mean, right. there wasn't a time. You know, I thought he was more effective than the tush push on that yeah. play. He also got to get healthier, too. He has to get healthier. Um, the, the, There clearly was a you – know, That when you watch, been more of a factor than what we thought. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a cleaning. When, when you watch year one as a starter and year two as a starter, you see the athleticism and how he was able to get out of that pocket. And then you watch this year from, from the – 
I know some people want to say, oh, week four, week five. Week one, he looked slow. Yeah, yeah, he got hurt. I thought I thought he got hurt in the, in the uh, Patriot game. Week one. Remember when looks, that linebacker hit him? I, he looks, I, I, yeah. I, I thought he got – I remember it was low hit on his knee. I thought yeah. he got hit in that game, and that may have started tenderizing him for the Jet game. He looked slow in week one. So, again, um, I don't know what happened in that game, but overall, Jalen Hurts got to get healthy. He got to get back in the lab. And Kellen Moore, um, he has a lot of work ahead of him because ultimately, you know, this offense, he had, they got to get this offense back on track. You know, on offense, it's not really a personnel issue at all. It's it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's strictly uh, it's execution issue. and, you know, developing issue. It, they they got to get Jalen Hurts back on track. Do I think he can get back on track? I do. How about I'm this? pretty optimistic about Jalen Hurts. Got to do better pass routes. Yes, yes. Yo, Troy board. Troy Aikman, this is why I love what Troy Aikman does because he and he's not the only one to do it. Greg Olson talked about it every time he covered every time he uh you know spoke on the Eagles game. So many every time I saw a commentator watching Eagles games and analyzing it, there was always at least one or two times in a game where where you heard guys saying, Why are these receivers so close to each other? Yeah. Why are these rock concepts overlapping? Yeah. Like these guys shouldn't be within five yards of each other. Yeah. That that's a pretty bad route combination. I I heard that so many times horrible, throughout the season. Horrible spacing. Yes. Yes. If you want to if, if you want to look at it from a basketball perspective, it was horrible spacing. It's just there, there wasn't a there. It was confusion, and maybe that's one of the reasons why he couldn't read some of those patterns because they had multiple guys in multiple positions at the same time. That's a good point. That's a good you point. Know, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe he couldn't make some of those throws. That they had, Tone. Think of the route concepts that they had. How many times in the game did you see multiple times when multiple Eagle receivers were, were in the same in spot? Place, yes. And he's looking at that, and you're sitting back there. Again, it becomes confusing for the receivers and the quarterback because you're making split decision decisions. So to me, I thought the poor spacing, the route concepts, the route trees. I just thought it was one on one basketball when I was watching that. Yeah, no, yeah, a, a lot, a lot of isolation. Like you saw too often, we saw Jalen Hurts drop back, standing there for like three, four, five seconds, trying to direct traffic, trying to clear some space. Too often we saw that, and and I, and I don't bring that up to take the onus off of Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts oh. has a lot to clean up, has a lot to clean up. You know, going from the 2023 season yeah, to the 2024 the offseason. Like but I, but I look at that offense and I say. They didn't do him any favors. Again, I felt like he was looking at that offense when he was running plays, saying, "Like, why are they so close? How can I make a play? How can I make a pass to a guy who looks open?" But then we got another receiver within five yards, and I got two, two or three defenders within arm's reach. I mean, how can I, how can I really make that throw? So again, um, I'm not making excuses for him. He has a lot to do on his own, but also the coaches. Um, I we need to see what Kellen Moore can do to shake things up. Now, these are kind of questions that I would ask Howie, and I'm asking you. Okay, I'll I'll um, pretend to be a uh, Howie right now. I'll put my go, I'll put my crown on. I will wear my cape. You know, right, simple. Here's my, simple my, my gold chalice. Like, here's the simplest one I could possibly. Oh, and you can uh, put your size four shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, and right, by the way, it. you know, they don't really make suits for guys like you, guy. You gotta like kind of go to the little kid section. <laughs> the you children's know, place is that what it's called? The children's place. <laughs> yeah, the children's place where you get kind of like a matching jacket and pair of pants and right. a pair of slip-on PF flyers. You don't even know what they are, but that's all right. Oh, I know what PF flyers. Uh, no, I know what PF flyers are. Oh, I know man, what I loved them shoes when I was a kid, man. <laughs> Here's a question. Okay, what led to the collapse, Howie? Hmm. Well. I did everything I could to give Nick Sirianni the pieces. <laughs> That's something he'll oh, say. <laughs> so it's he'll, the coach. He'll, he'll flip it fast. He'll flip it fast. Oh. But, um, <laughs> he's a lawyer. You See know what he does. I am? He's a lawyer. Well, then, Mr. Mr. Roseman, how come I heard the coach all year long go, don't blame Brian Johnson. Don't blame Brian Johnson. Don't blame Brian Johnson. Don't blame Nick. Don't blame Sean Desai. Don't blame Sean Desai. How come those guys got fired and you survived? Man, that's a hell that's a hell of a question, Mr. Cilio. I'm so glad I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. I'm gonna have How to redirect you? I'm gonna have to redirect <laughs> that to our guy Bob Lang to see what he says. Um <laughs> so let me stop playing before I, hey, before what, I get us in, you, I get why, in trouble. <laughs> honestly, what led to the collapse, Tone? All right, you know, I think honestly, um they they were ill prepared and they were on borrowed time. They were ill prepared. 
they were on borrowed time and Harry Roseman overestimated the personnel on defense. I think those are the three things that went wrong. And um whatever the inexperience of offense in the coordinating position. Yeah, whatever whatever magic Nick Sirianni had left, <laughs> that thing ran out after 10 and 1, baby. Ran Excuse out. Me. He's 13 and 12 as a guy who's in charge of that offense. When you put it that, you know, when you brought that up at the last minute yesterday, I was kind of upset because I'm like, I wanted you to expand on that. Because okay, well, because because no, because that's a that's a very interesting they way to look at it. Going away at two and five, and last year he was, as he said, it was his offense. So he gets the eleven and seven. Well, if you put it that way, he's thirteen and twelve running the offense. He ain't that bullshit record that people throw out there and call him the best coach in the NFC East. He's thirteen and twelve. I think he's one game over five hundred running the offense. When you when you frame it that way, that makes you look at him a lot differently, because when he's That's been that's why in full, he was almost fired. When you, when you all year he kept saying, "This is my offense. This is my offense. This is my offense." I'm like, okay, all right, here's your offense. All right, okay, all right, <laughs> okay. The, you you kept saying something all year. You go bury yourself, guy. You keep going there. Listen, you bury I kept yourself, saying it all keep year. Going keep, there. I'm, I'm like, all right, okay. Oh uh, no, and, he kept lighting himself on fire all week long doing that stuff. And guess what? Somehow, some way, Harry Roseman and Jeffrey Lowry, you know, put you know, put him out. And Brian Johnson had to wear that. So right now, Brian Johnson is without a job in the NFL. And you know, and we survived. killed we killed him all year. And Nick Sirianni survives the chopping block. You fired his whole staff and Nick's still here. I don't I've never seen that before. Here's another one. Why are they so confident in Nick? The same reason they convince themselves that they're confident in anything else. They bring up the record. That's what they do. You know, when you're when you're not being truthful, you you know, you fall on you fall on um deaf ears. <laughs> <laughs> you choose a low hanging fruit. And it's like, yeah, it's easy for me to say, oh, I mean, you know. You know, three um, back-to-back seasons of uh, making the playoffs, and you know um, that record and all that kind of stuff. And my thing is, if you ask the Philadelphia Eagles, if you ask them, they don't even think that's a product of Nick Sirianni. They fired a Super Bowl winning head coach. What makes you think they think a coach has value? How could so, a coach win? How could a coach win eleven ball games and his entire staff fired, and he's on the hot seat? It's it contradicts itself. It don't make sense. It it, it, it contradicts itself when. The assistant coaches get fired. The head coach survives. He wins 11 games, and you change the entire coaching staff out. Doesn't that contradict a, a, a successful coach? I've never what seen anything do you like know it. that has a record like that and it, that has been questioned about his leadership and direction of a football team? Can you name a guy? Because if Nick had any real pull, they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been able to fire his staff like that. They wouldn't have forced him to fire people like that. So... <laughs> This thing is um it's unprecedented, but that's but that's the kind of territory the area the Eagles like to live in. They love to break the mold. <laughs> Let me throw this at you. Did Howie Roseman in the last two years, 2022 and 23, has the Eagles developed their draft picks? That's a good question. Let me look at the draft history real quick. Because I want to make sure I answer. How many of them are there? Make sure our answer is honestly as possible. All right, here we go. So you said the last two years, so that's 2023. Last two years, 22 and 23. Okay, so what players have they developed into frontline players? So just so basically just starters? Is that what you mean? No, anybody. Okay, so I want to um, know who in the last two years has contributed to the football team's success. Okay. All right. So um I'm gonna I'm going to roll with Cam Jurgens. I mean, he had a he had he had some injuries, but he contributed. I agree. Um, uh, uh Jalen Carter, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like Tyler Stain contributed when they called on him. Um, he played in Tyler eleven Stain games. Contributed. He played in eleven games this year. Whenever, whenever Jur, whenever Jurgens or Dickerson, uh, went down, he came in and felt and filled that void. Was he good? Um, He's um he was okay. He's a rotational. He's a, he's you know, a rotational if I don't guard. Him, that so. means he must have been okay because yeah, he, no one got killed when he was in there. Okay, he was in that um he played he played in that in that first Cowboys matchup and he was all right. He was okay. okay. 
Okay. Um, so I consider him to be um, a contributor. Again, a rotational guy. We'll see if his future is starting right guard or not. But um, I, I, have, I, have, I have high hopes for him. So that's Cam Jurgens, uh, Tyler Steen. I said Jalen Carter, obviously. Um, Jordan Davis, his athleticism. I mean, not athleticism. I'm sorry. His conditioning is the, my only real concern with him. But he, but regardless of how we feel, he has contributed over the past two seasons. Have you been happy some with Jalen Carter as a draft pick with the Philadelphia Eagles? I have, I have, but ultimately, I feel like um, he's giving you half a season in two years. Wait, you said Jalen Carter? You talking about Jordan, Jordan, uh, um, Jordan, Jordan Davis? Davis. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, Jordan Davis. Uh, Jordan Davis. Last year, I was very disappointed. He's given you eight games, and this year. Yeah, he kind of has. But when I look at him, though, I see a player and I say, I'm not looking at your talent. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your effort and your, and your conditioning. And that's frustrating for me. But he has played. He's given You're he's given him a lot of snaps. Guy. Say it again. You're a combine guy. No, nah, I'm not a combine guy. Well, I'm you're talking to guy. me about his athleticism. And he's well, I'm never, talking, well, he's well, I'm talking about well, I'm talking about the first eight games. Like you said, he gave you eight oh, yeah. games. He was. You know, he was the fourth. And, and I saw a guy who was flying yep. up the line of scrimmage. So yep. I'm looking. I'm looking at that, saying, "Okay, what happened to that guy?" So, um, you know, again, to answer your question, Canada, it was I really think, like you said he, after that Bills rundown. Yeah. Of Allen, man, it was like he that shot was his load. Last bit of gasoline. That was the man. last bit of gas. <laughs> Listen, from that point on, he was he was <laughs> driving on four fun. flats. Four flats. And so, he was like MIA after that, man. I mean, you even right. had Brian Baldinger going, he should not be dressing, not playing. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, um the guys I'm rolling with right now, as far as contributors go, Cam Jurgens, Tyler Steen, Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis. Um, Sidney Brown contributed, even though he had up and an up and down year, but he contributed. He played a lot. Um Keely Ringo think played the guy who played on the worst secondary in the league, contributed. Hey, he contributed to the losses. He played. <laughs> <laughs> he plays. You see, when you guys tell me that they're playing and you're on the tw 32nd worst pass defense in the league, <laughs> you're telling me that that's contributing. I'm looking at you going, oh, okay. Hey, listen, you added you, – hey, listen, you added something. Oh, no, no, no. So, wait, <laughs> technically, he did contribute. Oh, Sills, hey, you want hey. to go technically, Silio? He did contribute. He did contribute. Out. I mean, he had a pick he six. Did. You know, he contributed. He played. You know what I mean? He, he got some time in. Uh, Achille funny. Ringo played on the back end, you know. But overall, though, um, I think the better question is, are there anybody – is there anyone that I'm – is there anyone that I see a future with? I think that's I think that's the, that's the real question. Is there anybody I see a future with? I'm not moving um, off of Jordan Davis. And I'm not moving off Jordan Davis yet. You know, I'm, no. I, I like Carter for the future. Yeah, um, I like two, team. I like Tyler Steen for the future. I like Cam Jurgens for the future. Um, <coughs> I, I, like I like Steen for depth. I, I like Sidney Brown to an extent. I need to see more. I like Keely Ringo to an extent. I need to see more. But overall, overall, I feel like they still haven't done enough on the defensive end in the draft. Let me go here now. Um, what is Kellen Moore's offense? What is this thing going to look like? What will the offense look like? It's what's basically the identity. You're going to throw the ball more. Going to run the ball more. Well, they're are definitely throwing. Are we going to try to expand the twenty-three? What are we going to do here? How do? You, is, this is a question that I have now, not just for Howie, but for me yeah. going into the offseason. Yeah. Um I mean, I, I mean, I, I have that I have that question too. I have that same question. You know, I'm 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 curious about what's going to be his game plan for getting getting the most out of your weapons and maximize you know what? The for me, I'm paying attention to how he gets Dallas Goddard involved. Because in 23. The way Dallas Goddard was used was completely unacceptable. And then he got hurt, so that didn't make it any better. But overall, I wasn't a fan of how Dallas Goddard was being used in 2023. He even um, said it. Right. So I'm curious to see what Kellen Moore can do with a guy like Dallas Goddard. And you did, obviously, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. We still don't know what the running back room is going to look like. Um, But, you know, I didn't really – 
I didn't really study the Cowboys and when he was there, but you know, just based off based off the rankings and the numbers, you know, he he was productive with those guys. So I, I would like to think that his football mind can translate to Philadelphia. With again, he has a lot of time. He let's be honest, how many coordinators go to back to back teams the way Kellen Moore has and has the weapons he's had to play with? Not often. So I think he should be. He should. He should. That's the operative word. He should be able to thrive. You know, with these kind of weapons in the building. Very optimistic. <laughs> have to be. I have to be. I'm still. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm. I'm still a fan at the end of the day, man. I, I got. I got to be optimistic, man. Got to be. All right. Here's you know, another question I, I have. I can't just. I, I can't just be jumping off the cliff, man. Off the top I, no, no. I got, I, mean? it. I got it. I got it. Especially when you look at it. I mean, the, some of the things that they do and say, it just doesn't line up for me. Like here, I, I get it. I get it completely. Will Howie invest in the linebackers? And in the linebacker spot, free agent or draft. So Howie in the last couple of years, last five years, hasn't drafted a linebacker in the top, a higher than a third rounder. Do mm -hmm. you think he changes that direction and takes a guy in the second round? Or do you think he stays status quo and tries to find another guy in free agency? Or he sticks with Zach Cunningham? This is what I think he's going to do. I think he's going to re-sign Cunningham. I think he's going to sign another guy in free agency, and then he's going to draft the linebacker in the third or fourth round, and then say, "Oh, I did. I, I handled the linebacker problem." Status he, quo. I think it's going to be status quo at the linebacker position. If I'm being completely honest, that's what I think. He, he, because you know why? He hasn't proven that he even will move off it slightly under any circumstance. What if Vic says, "I need a quality linebacker in there"? If he says that, I hope Howie listens. That's all I can say. I hope he listens. Well, shit, why'd you hire him if you're not going to listen to him? <laughs> why they hire... Uh, <laughs> why, hey, why, why do they, okay, okay, why, why do, they do a lot of things? Come hey, on, so you're answering answer hey, your own question. Hey, you got me. <laughs> all right, let's do this one. Will Howie take a safety high in the draft? Or will he go free agent there? I think he goes free agent there. I think he goes free agent because he believes in Brown. Exactly. You know, you know him. He looks at and also he believes in Reed Blankenship. He believes in those guys. So he's gonna he's gonna add in a veteran. Reed's Reed's my second team. Right. Because he's you know why? Think about it, Tone. If Reed Blankenship is on my second team, I've got a couple guys that are in there that are pretty good. Right, that's not if Reed's my if, if, yeah. If, if Reed just is an upgrade, my, look, if Reed Blankenship is my big nickel safety, yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, that's so but, am I. Yeah, because I like Reed Blankenship because you can hide him back there mm -hmm. when you got um, two other guys that can play. They have nine draft picks, right? I think so. Yes, they do. Let me see here. Yes, they have yeah. 22, 50, 55, third, four fives, and a sixth. I think, um, knowing the Philadelphia Eagles. They're going to they're they're going they're going to reload on the trenches in the O line because they're nervous about the Kelsey Lane Johnson thing. I could, I could totally see them drafting O linemen, edge rushers, corners, the linebacker, and the safety thing is where it gets a little tricky for me. But um, if I was them in the first round, I would go best available in the first round. That's what I would do. I don't. No, what's your thoughts? Do. What's your thoughts on that? Because they need talent. In my opinion, on that whole defense, if it's a linebacker, if it's an edge rusher, if it's a safety, a corner, I'm going best available. Okay, here are the guys that are going to be around 22 because I'm looking at corner safety, believe it or not, a running back. Um, corner, I'm not saying running back in the first at all, right, right? But what I'm saying is running back around like that 55th pick. I wouldn't be adverse to going with Jonathan Brooks from Texas. Something like that. Um, or trading back and getting another two. If Brooks is still there and getting him down towards the third and maybe using that third pick on him, they need a back, dude. And they're not going to spend money in free agency. No, they're not. That's they're just not going to spend money out. They're not going to go, here's six million. You know, people are like, oh, Dirk, I'm they're not if they didn't do that last year, they're never Tomorrow, doing that. 
That's what I'm saying. If they didn't give the money to Miles Sanders, a guy they drafted, a guy that knows their system, knows what's expected, knows how to operate in the RPO, if they didn't give it to him, why would I ever think they're going to pay DeAndre Swift? Why would I think they're going to spend real money? On, I do not believe them. Who, no, whoever what they could do, whoever they could, says they could find Swift. The only way they, to have a chance to sign. Here's the thing: the only way they have a chance at signing Swift is if he tests the open market. Yeah, and it's deep because it is very deep. The only way they had the only way to have a chance is if they they, they let him they let him go out there test open market, and then if he comes back or they figure out that okay you're not getting six or five, and then they and then they settle on I don't know a two year deal. Tone, or, I think he's or, sixth man in line. You mean I? You mean I, I, out of all the uh, yeah, free... like six or seven man in line there. I mean, then you got to start looking at it. You're kind of in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. Is the grass greener on the other side? If I take one million more versus what they're going to pay me at a million and a half less than I'm getting offered in the open market, then you got to look at opportunity. They ran the offense a lot through me. Mm -hmm. Is my opportunity going to be somewhere else on a shittier team? Right, and then With Kellen Moore, quarterback, and then Kellen Moore, he did a really good job with Tony Pollard, um, in 2022. And yeah, um, Tony Pollard had a down year under under Mike McCarthy. He was yeah. at his best. He was at his best under Kellen Moore. So maybe Darren Joseph looks at it as this may be an opportunity, like you said, for me to continue to expand my role in this offense. It's all a possibility, but overall. Um, I'm not betting on them being able to bring back DeAndre Swift. You have, if you ask me today, are they bringing are they bringing back DeAndre Swift? And knowing what I know about his market value, I would say no. Uh, so, the, so I, reason, I, I think they draft the guy. Honestly, I think they draft the oh, guy for whatever reason. At that 22, I see Kool Aid. I see the kid from Bama there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was look. I was looking. I was looking at some of his stuff and reading up on him, man. I like that guy, man. Me too. I'm sold on him. I think about if he's it. there. If he's there at 22, he's played we, against. He played against top tier dudes. Top all tier. the dudes you see in the NFL, he's covered. Mm -hmm. All those that guys, all the all, all the SEC guys, all of them. And 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 me personally, I, and I, that's I put where all lot, the wideouts are coming from now. I, I put a lot of stock in that. Now, every now and again, you have a guy that that played in Cincinnati, like a Sauce Gardner. Cor correct. Every now and again, but you that's a crapshoot. But but that's a crapshoot. I would much rather take my chances finding the corner in the SEC rather than where's Cincinnati? The big what is that? The, uh, it, 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 it's it was Mid America. I think now they're, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're in the Big Twelve or in the ACC. Okay, so the conference alignment and the changing of the conference. It's now, a lot of movement. A, be, uh, oh, they were in Conference USA. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So overall, every now and again, you find a Sauce Gardner from from a school like that. But but I much rather take my chances on somebody who's been guarding Correct. the best receivers. Like like get this: finding Jerry Rice at Mississippi Valley State, or um Derek Stingley. Derek Stingley was in LSU. He guarded LSU, the best you're, guys. You're gonna you're like 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 getting a, a guy like I said like like Jerry Rice at Mississippi Valley State versus recruiting in the SEC. You're gonna miss on Jerry Rice. But you know what I'm gonna do every time I need a wideout. The chances of me landing on a wideout that's going to be productive for my offense mm -hmm. is going to be higher because they're the top recruited kids. They play against the top flight kids in the country. They get the best coaching. Remember what you're you've got when when you're when you're going through draft analysis here, Tone. Mm -hmm. The SEC offers just this to a kid. If you land out as a starter at any one of those ten schools, you're getting the best coaching. Now twelve. You're getting the best coaching. You're getting the best talent you're playing against. The guys you're playing with and going against in practice. Hey, can you imagine being in an Alabama practice if you're Kool-Aid and you're going against Devontae Smith mm -hmm. as a sophomore? I mean, and you're going against Jalen Waddle as a sophomore? Uh -huh. And John Michi and Jamison Williams and all those guys. All those guys. Yeah. You're, you're going against them, and then you turn around and play George Pickens at Georgia. Yep. I mean yeah. – that matters to me. Yeah, I, I I hear you on that, and I'm and I'm I'm totally with you. That's why I do like that kid Kool Aid at you know at that spot. If he's there, I think I think they should take him. Like like my biggest fear is that they're going. With, my biggest fear is that the Eagles are going to overthink this draft. They're prone to do that. You think that would trade out of that pick and get more? Get this. 
I'll tell you what. Are, are, are you are, are you implying they trade up or trade no, back? Down. To get more seconds. You trade out of that one at 22 and you get two and you get two twos are, and a three. Are you saying that okay hey, quarterback lands there at 22 that a team mm -hmm. is desperate for? That's interesting because the Eagles historically have done a pretty good job drafting second round and down. Yeah. But and also you're looking at it like Okay, what if the guy I want is not there? I got a better chance of landing on some quality guys in that high yeah. second round. And filling more holes that you need to fill in that back end and that linebacker. Because and how he's going to feel more comfortable with threes and fours to be able to go grab them backers. And also, you're more prone to reach at that and spot. And you're cheaper. Yeah, you're more prone to reach at that 22 spot. So if you trade, So if you trade back... Then you can you can you can get some you can get some you can get some assets for your trouble, and probably make probably they could probably live in that second round if oh, they yeah. oh yeah if this they year, do it if they do it it's right deep. if they do it right yeah look, look, you know what tone it's hmm. funny you said something there that most people look at and why they value and they overvalue first round picks doesn't it ever bother people when you look at the great teams that are always picking in the bottom end of the draft like Baltimore. During Brady's time, Patriots, the Packers, the Eagles, those guys aren't reaching. It's best player available at the need position on your team. And most of the draft board after the first 15 falls in line. In the top 15, you're traditionally reaching for shit. Right. And you rarely get this. Look at what Nick Casario's doing. This year, by the way, the NFL Honors uh, Awards came out. Will Anderson's the rookie of the year. Head coach is D'Amico Ryans. And the offensive rookie of the year is C.J. Stroud. Very wow. rarely do you back land back on season, all of that. Back-to-back -back seasons where mm -hmm. the same team has the right. offensive Jets and defensive rookie of the year. They just but did it they last added year. coach of the year to that mix. Right. They added coach of the year to that mix. That's, that's rare air. That's rare air. Look at what Nick did. And Nick was in New England all them years. <sighs> There's no coincidence, Tone, that that guy was part of personnel decisions being made in New England. Listen, let me let me and say when this. When they lost him, they lost the guy who had the eye for the talent when it came to evaluating two, three, four, finding a guy for Nico Collins, mm -hmm. finding a coordinator like the kid who they got there who's coming back, that Slokey guy, or whatever. I mean, dude, they have done a great job at retooling that organization after the mess, and the McNair family's not really known for being quality owners and they have turned that thing completely around, man. Let me ask you this one. Um, will the defense be aggressive or the same this year? Will the defense be aggressive or the same? Well, I hope they're not the same because they were bad, but same text, uh, but the same, same as far as mentality goes. As far as mentality goes, let me ask you this real quick before I answer. What's historically what's been Vic Fangio's MO in terms of aggression control versus and contain. control and contain? What do the Philadelphia Eagles really want to accomplish? Control, control and contain. And get home I with think, your front four. Yeah, I think they're going to be more like they have in the past. Control and contain. Again, remember the one thing we didn't account for going into this season was the defensive line not showing up. Not we did not we did not account for that at all. I don't think anybody can say with a straight face, oh, yeah, I knew the D-line would fall off. No one thought that. The Eagles' D-line was coming into the season as being top five ranked, and when you add Jalen Carter to the mix, everybody was like, yo, this D-line is going to be unstoppable. Well, you know, week 12, week 13 came in. All of a sudden, they became stoppable. Um, and, all, and so I think they're going to be status quo on defense. I just think – what they're doing, though, I, I, what I think you're going to see, though, I think the difference you'll see, I think you'll see better execution and better teaching because you're getting you're getting the raw truth, the raw answers from the source. So and often the coaches. Right. And, and, and you have a better group of experienced guys in the building teaching these teaching these guys. So yeah. I think I think we're going to see improved execution. We're going to see um, imp uh, improved knowledge of where they're supposed to be. It's still going to be a talent discrepancy because I don't think this is a one-year fix. 
But at bare minimum, I think this defense should be able to go from being one of the worst to at least being ranked 15th. Martin, I like that kid from Oregon. I do. Um, is Howie getting a pass? I think he is. I think he is. He gets passes every year. He's been, for a guy for a guy to survive. He 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 survived. Andy Reid, Chip Kelly, Doug Peterson, and now he's potentially going to survive Nick Sirianni and maybe bring another head coach in the next couple of years. He's he's been getting passes all his uh, his whole time here. The only time he got any kind of negative energy was when he got thrown in the closet. But other than that, he's been getting passes the whole time. You know you, what GM you know. He, like Nick Howie Roseman is one of the most unprecedented, oh, the most unprecedented things we've seen in in, the, in sports. There, there, I can't think of any general manager that survives the amount of head coaches that he has survived. No, Yale, I don't want to fire Lori. I mean, I don't want to fire. Um, That's not what this Howie. conversation is I want about. His job title redefined. I want, I want more checks and balances for him. Yeah, That's what I, I want. want. I want his job title redefined. Stick with the books. Stay you out know, of the coach's room. No, he's he he's know your great. role. You know what he's he does. Great with he doesn't know his role. Yeah, I think I think Jeffrey Lurie has given him too much leeway to the point where he thinks he actually knows football. And um, I'm not sitting here saying I'm a survivor football. No, but I know my limitations as a person. When it comes when it comes to High Roseman, he's great at building contracts. He's great at you know keeping your books in order. He's I think great. He's really good at pro personnel. He's, he's great at pro, pro, uh, pro personnel. He he knows how to he knows how to find um, disgruntled players looking for a new place. He he knows how to navigate that that wire where you have young players on the final year of their rookie deal or players on the final year of whatever deal they're on. He knows how to manipulate those kind of situations. He's he's a very good deal maker trader. He's the kind of guy I send in with the mafioso and say, listen, make this deal happen. He's that kind of guy. But I'm not sending him in. To keep an eye out for, you know, the feds. You know what I mean. I don't. I, I don't trust him to find a rat, but I trust him to make sure the books are in order. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, so, totally, man. Here. So I just don't. I don't trust him with personnel. I just don't trust him with the with the uh, with the drafting. I don't. Not 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 consistent. He's hasn't he hasn't been a consistent winner in the draft. And drafting is hard to do in and of itself. I will admit that it's not, it, it's not an exact science. But damn it, he makes it look like it's easier than what it actually is. I like this guy's comment here. I never thought about that before I asked you the last question here. Where is it? Let me find it. Where is it? This guy right here. Um, this guy help with hundred percent. Have okay. you ever sent Brett? Have you ever seen Brett Veach on TV? That's a good point. Never. Have you ever seen him in public with the Chiefs? Only time I see him is when they're in the Super Bowl. Right. I don't I don't I don't hear him. I don't see him. He's never out front. That's a, it's a great point. He's he's never I've never I don't even know what he looks like. That's a great point, man thing. That's a it's a, a great point. Hey, I have you I know you know what he looks like cuz he was he was in uh, Philly a little bit there with Andy. But for me, Tone, I've never I don't I have no idea what he looks like. Only listen, the only way the only reason I know what he looks like is because I saw him at the last Super Bowl when they won. <laughs> That's the only okay. reason I know what he looks like. Only reason, you know, the Chiefs and there's owner. Howie front and center waving. Uh, hey, I, I did see a lot of waving this year, but last year I saw him at the Indianapolis locker room saying, "Here's my guys. Here's my weight." You know, can pat the yeah. coach on the back well, of the I, neck. One thing I will say though, I do appreciate that Jeffrey Laurie doesn't. He he's not always being seen like like Jerry Jones is. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that part. Now I need Harry Roseman to kind of take a page out of that book and just fall back. Now I know mid-season you don't see him, but except for at the games, shaking hands, smacking asses. On the side, you know what I'm saying? On, on the sidelines or in the box with the binoculars, looking at Kenny Pickett. Uh -huh. Jesus, that frightens me. You enough. want to know the one time? You, you want to know the first time I the saw one John? One time I seen with binoculars, he's looking at Kenny Pickett. I went, okay, that's <laughs> all I this. need to know. Listen to this. You want to know the first time I saw – well, I knew what John Lynch looked like, but you want to know the first time I saw him last year? Huh. The first time I saw him is when they smacked the hell out of the Eagles in Philly. 
He made sure he came out the box for that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, walked, he was walking on the sideline, slapping hands, giving handshakes like they won the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, oh, man. John Lynch is a hell of a GM. He is, man. He's done a nice job there. I got one last question for you. What are you going to do with Raddick this offseason? I think – I don't know if they can afford to lose a pass rusher like him right now. That D-line coming off the season they had. I don't know if they can afford to really lose pieces on that line. I would like to think Harry Roseman goes into those conversations trying to ex trying to restructure and, and extend. But what kind of number is Hassan Reddit looking for? 20. His estimated market value was not 20. I know. It's, it's, with it, it's, it's 15.8, 50.9. And, and I'm not saying that. Stuff like Clowney did three years ago. Look, and look, I'm not saying that estimated market value is law, but – Spot rack and over the cap, they do a pretty good job of they gauging do. these things. And I can have a hard time think, especially at this point, at that age, I have a hard time believing someone's giving him 20 a year. Have a hard time. So you restructure, give him more money up front, cut that salary down from 15 down to eight, mm -hmm. cut it in half. Yeah. And I'm, you I'm extend listen, I'll put it to this way. I feel more comfortable. Not, not saying that I would give him this money, but if I had to give somebody $20 million, I'm giving it to Sweat because he's younger. And I can bank and also he's he's a, he has a he's he's built like your prototypical edge rusher. I like his size. I, I, I like how rangy he is. I played a thousand reps almost. Yeah, he played like 850, 880, something Damn. like that. It was crazy. Man. Yo, I did not know this. Did you know Aaron Donald played over a thousand snaps the year they won the, the year they won the Super Bowl? That was the one and only time he played like over 90% of the snaps that year. Wow. One, one no wonder defensive. he got 30. <laughs> no wonder he got 30. <laughs> he got 30 million bucks that year. Yo, like throughout his throughout his career, he averages about 90% of the snaps played. That's Aaron, really awesome. Aaron Donald. That's insane. That's really, that's really tremendous. No one All thinks right. about that. Oh. You were fantastic. We're gonna get Merrill Reese on. Yes, sir. I'm excited yeah, about that. Know, I appreciate you. Merrill wasn't. Very kind to the team, too, at the end. No, he wasn't. Let's he hope he keeps that same energy. <laughs> he really wasn't. He was disappointed in the way the team fell apart at the end. So, Could you blame him, though? No, no, because you're 10-1. and one, You're 10-2. and two. And like I said earlier, Tone, hey, man, I saw the 49ers get rolled by the Ravens and the Bengals. People lose. Got Adam. rolled. But my like you and I were saying, dude, you can't get beat by Tyrod Taylor. You can't lose locked. to the Cardinals. You can't, you can't at home. You can't. You, you just can't do that. Over the Cardinals, a three-win team. Yeah, something like that. They were bad. You can't. You can't lose those games. You just can't. So that's why I say with a straight face, how how can I believe he didn't lose that locker room? How? You lost to the Cardinals and the Giants. How? I'm gonna push back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you like, go, my man. I, I, I love you, we, <laughs> we just disagree yeah, right I there. I love him, man. You, you, could, you, you I wish you were. I would slap. I go when I heard that I went. <laughs> <laughs> I said this guy's going places. All right, hey Tone, great stuff as always, yes, my friend. I appreciate you. It's always fun. You got it. That is our good friend, Tone. And as I advertise, Merrill Reese will join us at the bottom of the hour. Keep it here on the National Football Show. bubbles and the bubbly go for the story and the stories go for the win go to ocean casino resort book your trip at theoceanac.com
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their fantasy pick 'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game, and the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Nick Sills National Football Show. So Bob Kraft finally admitted that he made a mistake in allowing Belichick to get rid of Brady. And and by the way, I guess Tom Brady, our good friend Jason Cole, I had a chance to like kind of email Mr. Brady and Tom Brady Sr. And he's like, look, you know, I don't want it being taken out of context here. Bill's a great coach. He just got shitty bedside manners. So again, you have to see through that. And I, I've made this point to you about certain guys in the locker room. And you know what? I think maybe the Eagles missed this this year. Merrill Reese will join us at the bottom of the hour. Um, This is what I tell you. Yale, probably, Yale says probably cost them two Super Bowls. I think that's fair. Okay, how about this? Every team has a buffer player and you're hoping it's your leader that's in your locker room when you have a hard-ass coach like a Greg Popovich or a Bill Belichick. And in my opinion, when you lose Tim Duncan in the locker room or you don't have a strong voice in the locker room like you did in Philly, you don't have a person that can settle the locker room. That was as much as Jalen's issue too, okay? Jalen's showed me a little bit that he couldn't stop the one in six, two or the one in seven. He couldn't stop it because usually someone's in that locker room that will say something like this. Hey, leave your egos at the door. This is all about team. And T- Duncan goes in there and goes to Tony Parker, and Mano Ginobili, and he tells those guys, hey, don't worry. This is our team. That's why that dynasty in San Antonio lasted as long as it did. It lasted as long as it did because they had a leader in the locker room in Tim Duncan. Tom Brady did the same thing. He was the buffer between the hard-ass Belichick, and he was more of the player going, hey, this is what he really means. Bill didn't realize the importance of Tom Brady's influence in the locker room. I don't know if Jalen has a gigantic – how can you have a giant influence in the locker room when they're making you less accessible? You know what I'm saying? You're hurting his presence in the locker room if he's less accessible. So you've now made it that your top guy is less accessible. These are Jeff Kerr's words. These aren't my words. He's in the locker room all the time. I heard that on Sports Take. That wasn't my take. I heard Jeff Kerr say that. Am I wrong, Tone? The Eagles, I think maybe both Hurts and the Eagles have made him less accessible. Those were those guys' words, not mine. I didn't say that. How can you have a locker room presence when you're less accessible? How can you? Brady's always accessible. Duncan was accessible too. Here's the example in San Antonio. When Duncan left, Greg Popovich couldn't connect with Kawhi Leonard. He didn't know how to compete. He didn't know how to communicate with him. He had no idea how to communicate with him. He got so pissed off, he traded him to another country. 
You know what Kawhi did? Fuck it. I just won a championship in Toronto. Made him look like a jackass for not being able to deal with a guy who won you an MVP award and helped you win a championship in San Antonio. You know, when, when you have those kind of coaches like that and you got players in your locker room that know how to calm the environment, no matter what your coach is, you can have a hard-ass coach. I'll say it again. I think what they did in New England was they underestimated the importance of Brady's um, – I, I think they underestimated Brady's presence in that locker room. And that's the quarterback's responsibility too, especially when you're the high paid guy. All right. You know, we, we had Ron Jaworski on with us earlier and he looked at the whole off season here and he thinks the Eagles have hired some good coordinators here. There's no question that there was a lot of turmoil at the end of the season going one and seven. Um, and, and a lot of question marks. And by the way, our good friend Merrill Reese was honest about his assessment. Let's bring Merrill in now and ask him his assessment on what he sees as they move forward here in this offseason. First and foremost, how are you, Merrill? I'm well, Dan. Good to see you. All right, Merrill. Give us your last, give us your takeaway from the last 10 days on what you witnessed with the organization. First and foremost. Do you believe they're going to right the ship? Yes. Yes. I'm I'm encouraged. Uh I, I really am encouraged. I think they they too took two very big steps in adding Vic Fangio and Kel Moore. I think those are, are very positive steps. Would you agree, Merrill, that for you, and even Angelo said this a couple days ago, that you that he, Angelo doesn't have a concern with Jalen Hurts at all. He thinks that's the one thing that you can count on the most when it comes to writing the ship and turning what happened at the end of the season down. Are you concerned about him at all, Merrill? No. Nope. Or are you not concerned about him? Not concerned at all. Not in the least. I think he's one of the, the great young quarterbacks in this league. I think he will only continue to elevate his play. I think it's, it's a lot about putting him in the right offense. And I thought the offense – as a whole, last year deteriorate, t- deteriorated in those last seven games. Well, Merrill, I'll ask you then, what do you think was the reason for the collapse? A lot of things. I, I think we ignored the fact that they were sliding by early in the season. And I use the word resilience often during those first 11 games how they kept fighting their way back and how they they knew how to win. And they lost that. They lost that. And when they were beaten by San Francisco, uh, if you remember that game, the very beginning of the game, they marched right downfield and only came away with three points. And then they marched and and then they they absolutely stymied the 49ers, marched downfield, but again, only came away from with three points. And from that point on, the field completely tilted. And they were going uphill, and the Niners were going downhill, and it wasn't even a game. And I think the, the Niners showed some things. They they created a template, and everybody else just piled on. Here, here, here's my here's my concern about Nick being back. And you can tell me if you think I'm wrong on this. All year long. Um, Merrill, all year long, he kept saying, don't blame Brian, don't blame, don't blame Brian, don't blame Brian, don't blame Sean, don't blame Sean. Yet the two coaches that got canned were the assistant coaches that he didn't want anyone to blame, and he survives. I mean, how does a coach win 11 ball games, go to the playoffs three years in a row, and we're talking about survival? I mean, it just doesn't seem to add up. Merrill is kind of contradicting a little bit that a guy with a record with a 667 win percentage had to have a conversation with the owner about saving his job. It just didn't seem, it just seemed a little chaotic at the end for me. Am I wrong? Well, I think the whole season was chaotic at the end. I mean, it, it, it ended up chaotic. Uh, the first part of the season was fun. The rest, the rest of it was awful. And I didn't really have any confidence that they were going to beat the Bucks in Tampa Bay because I thought Nick did the right thing 
on the final Sunday of the regular season. I was all for playing the regulars because I felt they had to recapture their game. They had to show that they could get it together in time for the playoffs. And when they had that embarrassing performance against the Giants and were trailing 24 nothing at halftime before he mercifully pulled the regulars, I knew they were in just deep, deep trouble. And I did not feel confident going into Tampa Bay, and uh, rightfully so. They were terrible that night, too. So, yeah, it was, it was a crash landing, no doubt about that. But they move on, and they, they did what they felt they had to do. How about this, Merrill? Why such a drastic move when you're going like you're these coaches they're hiring and these coordinators they're hiring are some of the most experienced coaches that you have in our league last year they hired guys who had very little experience to no experience and they changed the right i counted there were 24 guys in new positions last year on last year's staff that were either elevated or new hires there were 12 of the 24 frontline coaches now they've revamped it for two years in a row now. What, why that change, do you think, that they went from that to this? Because that didn't work, and hopefully this will. Now, I just want to point out that I think both Sean Desai and Brian Johnson are good men. Yes. And coaches, and they will be back, and they will do well. Uh, you know, hindsight, as they say, is twenty twenty, And I think there's no doubt, looking back, that there is no way they should have made the move by changing defensive coordinators when they did. But then you look at Buffalo, and didn't they change offensive coordinators yep. and then go on a winning streak? So Nick did what he was thought he had to do. He, he showed that he was desperate at that point, and it never worked out because the players were confused in making the change. It just here it did not work out. As far as Brian Johnson was concerned, Nick Sirianni said that was his offense – Brian Johnson was running. So yeah, the the blame doesn't all go on Brian Johnson. And I think he's a he's a bright coach. And I, I wish both him and Sean well, because they're good men and they're bright football people. And here's what I'll say about that. I told Raheem this years ago, and Raheem Morris and I have remained friends. He's now the new head football coach at the Atlanta Falcons. And Merrill, I was kind of like a jerk back in the day, but we're we're better today. I think I'm a little tad bit more mature today. I went like this to Raheem. I go, Raheem, you see this? He goes, yeah, what is it? I go, it's a blank paper. And he goes, yeah. And I go, that's your resume. What makes you think you deserve the head coaching job for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? I go, did you think you were getting fired when you were walking into the offices of the general manager there with Mark Dominic? And he goes, I did. And he ends up having a failure time there, but he learns – in other stops in Washington, Atlanta, as an assistant with McKay, and then he goes out and becomes the coordinator again. I think sometimes the journey, sometimes, Merrill, you just have to find the right fit for an assistant coach. Some Look at Frank. Frank went around to nine different places. It landed in, a, it landed in Philly, and he wins a Super Bowl as a coordinator. So they'll find their spot. I think they're talented people, too. Maybe it just wasn't the right place for them at the right time. I, I still think Frank is a terrific coach, but I do he, too. He didn't do it in, in Indianapolis because of things that were out of his control. And I think he was in a bad situation in Carolina where he really didn't have a prayer. And I I still think I still think that Ron Rivera is a very good coach. He took the Panthers to the Super Bowl, but then most of the time he suffered with the Daniel Snyder regime in Washington. It's a shame he doesn't have a chance with the, the Josh Harris, but that's what happens. New owners come in, and they want new head coaches. But Ron Rivera is a very, very good football coach. Well, I'm, uh, hey, hey, Merrill, I'll tell you why Frank's not the OC in Philly. There's 38 million reasons. <laughs> okay? Uh, there's, there, there's nothing more than that. He's sitting in the beach on Carolina right now collecting David Tepper's money. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I mean, getting him out, I'm like this. I go, so you want to be the coordinator of the Eagles? He goes, would you have to renegotiate your $38 million? I go, I'm not renegotiating anything. <laughs> you know, and I don't blame him, but you know what? Doug took a deep breath for a year. He and did. And got the Jacksonville job, and he's done well. I mean, last year they, 
they kind of fell backwards a little bit at the end. But but Doug Peterson's a terrific coach, and he'll have Trevor Lawrence and that team playing well next year. Why are you so confident in Nick Sirianni this coming season where a lot of people are suspect on him being back? Or how about this? Merrill, I'll say half the room. Half the room is probably – there's probably a 50-50 side of it right now. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's 50-50. Bring him back. Don't bring him back. Why are you confident in bringing him back? Why don't we say instead of Nick Sirianni, why don't I say it with this team? I don't want to use the word and say that I'm confident in this team. I'm encouraged in what they've done. I'm encouraged by what they've done. So confident is a different. Last year, going into this season, I was confident that they were going to be a very good team. They should have won the Super Bowl, should have won Super Bowl 57. Okay, they didn't, but they had made some improvements. They had, I thought, a great draft, and I was confident that this team was going to be what I thought they were in the first 10 weeks of the season, first 10, 11 weeks of the season. I thought they were the best team in football at one point, and so did a lot of other people. So going into this season, I and I and I felt this. I, I say I'm from Missouri. Show me, but I but I am encouraged. I am encouraged when you bring in a Fangio and you bring in a Kellen Moore, and I just know how dedicated and how good Jalen Hurts can be. Now they still have to bolster their defense. They still need help at linebacker, and they need help in the secondary. So uh, that that's something that there's no doubt they have to improve. But what they've done so far encourages me. Two last questions for you. Is Howie Roseman, do, do you think he's getting a pass? And because if he gets the credit for building 22, isn't he accountable? I'm not going to say responsible, Merrill, but isn't he accountable also? If we're talking about assistant coaches like Brian Johnson and also Sirianni, that you overestimated maybe uh, Dean's impact that he'll make, maybe some youth and the linebackers that you brought in. It just seemed that they were behind the sticks in a lot of decisions that they made last year. You think he's gotten a pass a little bit? I don't think he's gotten the pass. I think every general manager in football is accountable. And I think Howie will tell you that he's accountable for everything. And he will tell you that he has a high standard and it wasn't reached by anybody during this past year. But uh, he's he's done some great things in the past. I thought they had a great draft, didn't you? When they got Jalen Carter, when they moved up to get Jalen Carter, who was probably the best defensive player in the draft. And I then think he is going to be a fabulous ball player. And having gone through what he went through, after week 13, it's a common thing. After week 13, 14, all of a sudden, you've never played. And plus, you got to remember something with him also, Merrill. Here's a guy that did a lot of rotating at Georgia, and you've got to get your mentality ready to play. Look at Fletcher. Fletcher had such a good season. And here's a 33-year-old guy that was prepared every single game. Even Milton Williams, I think, is a really fine ball player. And for me, those guys know how to prepare themselves for a long 17-game season. I think both Davis and Carter have to understand it's not just about talent. It's about preparation as well. Right. And that that's why I think you bring Fletcher Cox back or you do everything you can because the importance of having someone like that in the locker room and around those young guys, especially with the equity you've invested, I think he's important to the growth of those guys. Dan, let me ask you, uh, Fangio's a 30 defense, right? That's his, yeah. his MO. So wouldn't Jordan Davis fit well as a nose tackle? He will, and but what they'll do, he's a, con he's a controlling, contained coach. You're going to see a lot of nickel with him, which means 70% of the time you're going to see probably four down. So, But what they'll do on first and second, I don't know if they're going to line him up head over the nose or they're going to shade him on a tilt or if they're going to play two tackles over the tackles or maybe play again with a five front look and a 50 look. I mean, he, one thing he did in Miami that was great last year, he improved the sack total and broke records. And I tell you what I like about him too, Merrill, is that, you know, I heard a lot of guys down in Miami bitching about him. Good. 
I don't want anybody really yeah. loving my D coordinator. I want yeah. them playing for him. Yeah. And don't worry about whether you like him, whether or not you're doing right by him. And so um, I think the question mark for me will be who's playing Mike linebacker and who, how are the safeties going to be and how are you going to utilize Sydney? And I was telling everybody earlier on Sydney fitting in Vic Fangio's system. He's a very aggressive kid. I mean, a super aggressive kid, the way he tackles, yeah. the way – he runs to the ball. Love him. I do too, but are they going to be aggressive or are they going to stay schematically the same, control and contain, dump underneath? Because that's been a mantra of his. By the way, just so you know, Merrill, he recruited me in 1981 when he was in high school and he was at uh, uh, Milford Academy. I went up there. My high school coach goes, don't you remember Vic Fangio recruiting you and bringing you up to Milford? I went, no. He goes, he said, you sat right in front of him. You were 18 years old. I'm like, get out of here. You went to North Carolina after that. So I've always been a fan of the guy. I just think it's going to be interesting to see what kind of pieces they give him and how much influence he has on the draft. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think both Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio are going to have maximum input. You think so? You think they will have say in the, but because look at it, look at the assistant uh, coaches they're bringing in. I, I don't mean to say that they're going to be picking players, right? But I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be heavily consulted. Well, this is, this is, I told everyone, this is how coaches, NFL guys don't sit around watching a guy playing against North Carolina and Vanderbilt. What they do is they tell the personnel guys, this is a profile player I want, a guy like a Derek Brooks, a guy like a Ryan Shazier. Somebody like that that has a skill set like mm -hmm. that that can play off the ball, can play on the ball, can hit fill gap, can cover tight ends, is really recognizable on getting running backs. So to me, that's the kind of profile. Whatever that name is on the back of the jersey, Merrill, the assistant coaches don't know what that name is yet. They're just looking for that fine guy. Howie and his people go out, and they kind of funnel it down to five guys, and they go, here's the five guys. They put them on tape. Which guy do you think best sets your fills, your skill set? Then they go from there. Well, it'd be nice if they say, uh, let's find the Micah Parsons. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I'd rather have them say, let's find a Seth Joyner. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Merrill, thank you so much, my friend. I mean, it's always an honor to get you on here, and I can't thank you enough. My pleasure, Dan. It's always good to be on with you. Thank you. You bet. Thank you so much the great Merrill Reese. We appreciate him coming aboard, folks. Absolutely fantastic. We appreciate him stepping in there with us. Please hit the like button. Keep it here on the National Football Show. bubbles and the bubbly go for the story and the stories go for the win go to ocean casino resort book your trip at theoceanac.com
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their fantasy pick 'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Great Philly Godfather going to join us at 5.30 Eastern time. Yes, sir. By the way, I'm going to get to the awards here in a second, but I want to ask one question. Very simple. That's all we've been doing today is asking simple questions. Name me one thing Nick Sirianni did this year that was good in 23. Go. What did Nick Sirianni do great in 2023? Go. What did he do great in 2023? I'm open ending it. Just a question. Oh, look at birds. Live for Howie. Wait, I got to write that. That's a fabulous take. Live for Howie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. If you, let's see here. Simple questions for a simple man. You're good unless you're the birds. Might want to try to put that in a sentence there, kid. He 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 was a fabulous dartboard tone. Yeah. Okay. Got me to call him Fredo. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, please. I just want one good thing he did. One. Here. So how many people think that a coach's record means that he's better than the next coach? So when you, what I'm saying here is, here, I'll give you the, I'll, 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 I'll use this to go along with your idiotic takes that Nick Sirianni is the best coach in the NFC East. It's such a dumb comment. All-time winningest coaches, NFL history list. Let's take a look at that. Here we go. So, How many people believe that Marty Schottenheimer is a better coach than Chuck Knoll? Marty's got more wins. Chuck Knoll's got four Super Bowls. Well, wait a minute. Chuck Knoll only has a 566 win percentage. Nick Sirianni's better than Chuck Knoll. So you would take Nick Sirianni over Chuck Knoll because he has a better record. Let's see Andy Reid. 
Andy Reid has a 641. You would take Nick Sirianni because he's won and he's been to the playoffs three years in a row over Andy Reid. You would take Nick Sirianni over Tom Landry because he has a better win percentage than Tom Landry. Let's go down the list there. You would take Nick Sirianni over Mike Tomlin because he has a better win percentage. You would take Nick Sirianni over Bill Parcells because he has a better win percentage. Been in the playoffs three years in a row. How flawed is that thinking? You would take Nick Sirianni over John Harbaugh, Joe Gibbs, Bill Cower, Tony Dungy. Mike Ditka, Dick Vermeil, George Allen, John, Ma- not John Madden, he has a 741 or 759. Because he has a better win percent. How come your philosophy sucks here when we're talking about win percentages? This guy's got a 667 win percentage and he's been to the play. Who fucking cares? You really think that guy's a better coach? Then Chuck Noel, Andy Reid, because he's got a higher win percentage, he's a product of the environment around him. He didn't make that environment, bring those players, and he had nothing to do with Jalen Hurts' drafting. Nothing. He had nothing to do with Jalen Hurts' development. Shit, when he runs the offense, they're 13 and 12. Show me one redeeming thing that he has done to earn that 667 where you say he's here. You think he's a better coach than Mike McCarthy? How in the hell can you say that when McCarthy's got a Super Bowl and has helped develop Brett Favre and also Aaron Rodgers and Dak Prescott? And he owns a ring. He's better. Really? How? As a play caller? You would take Nick Sirianni as a head coach play caller over Mike McCarthy. you got to be kidding me. How about this one? What would Brian Dable do as a head coach in Philly? What do you think he would do in Philly? You think he'd do a better job than Nick? I do. I think he's the second best coach in the East. Yeah, but Sills, he's got Daniel Jones. That was there when he got there. He he got Daniel Jones a $40 million a year contract, and he stinks. He's made the playoffs. I'll tell you what, Brian Dable's job's not in jeopardy. Nick Sirianni's job was. Because the Giants know they got a good coach. He better than Brian Dable. Dan Quinn took the Atlanta. Hey, Dan Quinn, I wouldn't consider Dan Quinn a great head coach. And that Washington hire. Well, shit, he did take the Falcons to the Super Bowl, and they should have won that bitch. What what exactly? And actually, he's one of the best coordinators in the NFL. Nick's not a good coordinator. What has he done more than Dan Gwen when it comes to accomplishing and developing a football team? What are you talking about? Dan Quinn can hand... Handpicked his job. And there's Nick. I think Nick is actually the worst head football coach in the NFC East. No coach with 11 wins has to have a powwow with his owner on whether or not they keep him, unless he sucked. You're not thinking this fairly or correctly. How in the world can you sit here and justify a coach who's been to the playoffs three years in a row with a 667 win percentage. And then you tell me when it was hit or miss that he was going to be retained as the head coach, where you're telling me you think that they think that guy is really not replaceable. When you talk like that as an organization, 
Nick Sirianni is replaceable. He's got the least secure job in the building, and that was from the day they hired him. Because it doesn't matter what you do. The organization doesn't look at you as a reason for the 667 percentage. They look at you as a byproduct of it. That's what they look at you as. You're a byproduct. (laughs) Fire Andy Reid, fire Doug Peterson, fire Nick Sirianni. Who cares? That's why they were going to replace him. That's why they talked to Belichick. Belichick is waiting in the wings for the Eagle job. I I completely believe that. Vic Fangio and and uh, Bill and Bill Belichick working together that could go down. No, but Howie like because by the way Howie gets if Nick gets fired Howie's right behind him. <laughs> okay, it'll be a house cleaning. Oh, yeah, next year, get this. You better get, like, the um, Clorox wipes. This is going to be ugly. You know how you – do you guys watch Pulp Fiction? And the fixer came in, and he had to clean up because they shot the kid in the head in the car. That's kind of what this is going to be. A tone, they're going to have to get industrial strength cleaner. A lot of arm and hammer. (laughs) This is going to get ugly. They're going to be cleaning it up off the walls. They're going to be cleaning it up off the floors. They're going to be cleaning it up everywhere. Yeah, because there's going to be a lot of pieces everywhere. Holy cow. Now you missed the spot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Silsy, you hoping Nick Sirianni gets fired? I don't have to hope for that. I don't have to hope for that. He will. Hey, it wasn't Brian Johnson's fault. It wasn't John Desai's fault. Liar. (laughs) Liar. What was that movie that they did that? Liar. (laughs) That guy's the biggest liar I've ever seen as a head coach, and I've seen a ton of head coaches are bullshit artists. Liar. (laughs) Absolutely. Hey, it wasn't their fault. Yeah, he, he, hey, who am, who am I? When I was in Seattle, lost in Seattle. Hey, 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 who am I? When I was lost in Seattle and I made a coordinator change. And, you know, I know on offense, what we were hoping for was that the tooth fairy came down And that the tooth fairy would magically jump in the way and we would have pass interference. And I was just hoping that if we threw the ball up, the tooth fairy or like Gazoo or somebody showed up to like get pass interference for us, but it never happened. Cinderella didn't happen. What? (laughs) I just made that story up like Nick. I just made that up. Just make it up. <laughs> I just, I guess, yes, yes, Tone. I did use Kazoo from the Flintstones. Yes, I did. It was a Flintstones reference. Kazoo, the guy with the big fat head. Yeah, like Matt Patricia. Matt Patricia's Kazoo with the big fat head. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, fairy godmother? Sure, all right. Who cares? I thought the fairy godmother would float in and get a pass interference for us. Yeah, didn't happen. And the players go like this. What's he talking about? We 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 went off script. Oh, shit. <laughs> you caught me in another fib. <laughs> Oops, I fibbed again. <laughs> See, in Philly, they're fibs. They're not lies. At the Nova Care Center. They're fibs. Little white lies. I don't even know why they call them that. Call them Italian lies? Sure, all right. The little fibs. <laughs> don't blame, don't blame Brian Johnson. Blame me. Okay. 
you survive and they get fired. I'd say, hey, um, here's a me- hey, right? Here's a message for Kellen Moore and Vic. When that guy says this, don't blame them, blame me. If I were those guys, I'd come out publicly going, hey, that was his call. <laughs> that was his call. Because if you go along with it, you're going to get your ass fired. Yeah, yeah, it's him. It's him. You better point him out. Hey, you had Jason Kelsey talking about how the offense was vanilla under vanilla Nick. <laughs> hey, that's a that's a great word. I'm going to have to tweet at Jason Kelsey at that. Jason Kelsey has named a really good name for Nick Siri Liar. You know what that is? Vanilla Nick. <laughs> Sounds like an ice cream cone with sprinkles. Sounds like an ice cream cone with sprinkles. Right? All right. The great one, Philly Godfather, is next. Keep it here on the National Football Show. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-X. Eagles. Power hour. Damn, you know what? I haven't gotten to two topics yet. I still have a topic to get to here. It's like the lineup scene in the Bronx tale. All right, now point out to us who did it. (laughs) I love that movie. I love Chaz Palminteri. I absolutely love Chaz Palminteri. Flexing goes, Sills, no more Hooter commercials? What are you talking about? They'll be back in the fall next year. They ran a fall promo. I think we'll do something with them during the NCAA tournament, too. They've been with me 40 years. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Made up as usual. I mean, my relationship with them is fine. Phenomenal. They've been friends of mine for 40 years. 40. All good. Um, I vote on these. Do I have my... Oh, I do have my wallet. Uh, hang on for a second here. Let me get this. And... These are the NFL honors. Let me see if I have this in here. Let me see if I still have this. Do I? I got my NFL Players Association card. I know. Lifetime member. Uh... Damn, where is that card? Hey, I'll tell you this. At least I get to go to the Hall of Fame for free. Got a lifetime pass to go to the Hall of Fame. That's through the NFL Players Association, actually. Where the heck is that? Damn, I thought I had my NFL alumni card in here. I think I still got an old one. Anyway. Um... So I vote on the honors and the MVP. I think I got an old one in here somewhere. Eh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so I vote on I vote on all these awards. And this is and I, by the way, these aren't all the people and I'll tell you who I picked. MVP. Winner is Lamar Jackson. Baltimore Ravens. Second place, Josh Allen, Buffalo Bills. How you done? <laughs> Wait a minute. How can a guy lead the NFL in turnovers and be second in the MVP voting and your guy second in turnovers and nowhere in this list? How's that possible? How's that possible? Josh Allen led the NFL in turnovers. And he finished second in the MVP voting. <laughs> Brock Purdy, third. I'm, I'm going to start calling that guy Mr. 870. Offensive player of the year, Christian McCaffrey. Tyree Kill is the runner-up. Defensive player of the year, T.J. Watt. I didn't vote for him. I voted for Miles Garrett. I voted for Christian McCaffrey for player of the year, and I voted for Lamar. And those were my top three MVP guys, too. Lamar, Allen, and Purdy. How you doing? I've been voting on this for now 10 years. Miles Garrett was second. Michael Parsons, third. Max Crosby, fourth. Roquan Smith, a linebacker, Howie. Finished fifth. Coach of the year. Something that you guys will never understand until you get rid of that dude. D'Amico Ryans. I voted for him. Thought he did a sensational job. Kevin Stefanski, second. Dan Campbell, third. LaFleur, fourth. Packers. Sean McVay, fifth. Rams. All teams heading in the right direction. And your coach is on the hot seat next year. Whew. That Bucks and Burner getting a little warm. Oh. <laughs> Woo! Offensive Rookie of the Year, CJ Stroud. 
And the runner-up was Puka Nakua, Rams. So get this, man. Here, here's the next one. And I voted it that way, too. Defensive Rookie of the Year. I did vote Will Anderson the Defensive Rookie of the Year. I did put Jalen Carter second. Kobe Turner from the Rams third. I thought he actually outplayed Jalen. Let all rookie tackles and tackles and also in sacks. And the kid from Wake Forest was drafted like in the third round. Devin Weatherspoon was fourth. And Brian Branch was fifth. Lions. So get this this year. The Houston Texans had the rookie of the year, the offensive rookie of the year, and the head coach of the year. Talk about going in the right direction. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I wrote a topic down here and we were going to talk a little bit about the draft. Um, and I'm going to look at it right now here before we get the Philly Godfather on. The Eagles have the 22nd pick, the 50th pick, the 53rd pick, the third rounder, four fives. And here are the players that I've, 14 players that you're going to be able to look at. First 22, when you're looking at 22 players, I think you need a corner and safety in that position. I don't think anybody thinks that they'll go anywhere else in that, right? Corner, I don't believe they'll go safety. Now they could trade out of that pick, but for me, I think it's Kool-Aid. If Kool-Aid is there, Okay. And someone goes like Chris goes, I'd still rather have Carter. Um, how about this one here, Chris? I think Carter's a fabulous football player, and I think he's gonna be sensational. But Chris, know this: what position is more of a value in the NFL? An edge rusher who can rush the pass or cover tight ends, cover backs out of the backfield, and play the run. What's more of a valuable asset and who are you going to pay more? A defensive tackle or, and no, get this. Here's something to think about. What if Jalen Carter turns out to be Aaron Donald or say he's Chris Jones? Is how are we going to pay him $30 million? Are you going to pay Jalen Carter $30 million in two years? Are you? Are you going to pay a D tackle $30 million if he turns into Chris Jones? You got to remember how they operate. You think which you think they're going to pay a D tackle 30 million when you got to pay both your you want hey, get this. You want to pay both your wide receivers 25 million and your quarterback 50. And then he want to turn around and give a D tackle 30. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't be dumber. It's not how they roll. Tom brings it up all the time. They develop all these guys and you know what they do? They didn't pay Fletcher Cox $25 million. Not true. Absolutely not true. Uh-uh. They're not paying him that. You're going to pay a guy. The cap goes up 18%, ding dong. This guy makes it seem it goes up 100000 It's going to go to 240 this year, 240.1 from 224.5. It goes on an average of 18%. You'd want to pay 25 here, 25 there. Who? Hey, by the way, are you going to pay Landon Dickerson the 20 he's going to command? 
So wait a minute. Let me get this right. And then you're going to pay Landon Dickerson 20, and you're going to pay Jalen Carter 30. <laughs> oh, my God. Hilarious. See, when you draft a guy like Carter and you get him high in the draft and you get a steal, that guy's not going to come back and give you hometown discounts. Hertz didn't give you a hometown discount. You gave him a bag of money up front. He didn't give you a hometown discount. Why would Jalen Carter give you a hometown discount? He ain't doing that. Hey, get this. Get this. You think Jalen Carter makes $30 million if he turns out to be Chris Jones. Good luck, kid. All right. I think you're hanging around Kool-Aid. With that 50th pick, if you don't trade out of it, you're going to hang around with Keely, Kaylin King, the quarterback, cornerback from Penn State, Would you draft a running back here? That kid, Jonathan Brooks, or would you wait until the third round for Trey Benson from FSU? You need to get a running back. Okay? What is Kelly Green? Cecil was saying all this before they paid her. Hoss. You paid Hertz at the expense of the defense. You didn't do any, you didn't do your team any favors by giving Jalen that money. I told you you would have to take away players, and you did. Everything I said was true. They paid the player, sacrificed the defense. No one makes money over there, there's no investments. There's, you know what you have on defense? Bad contracts, bad players. Yeah, you said they couldn't play Hurts. Yeah, they paid Hurts at the expense of your roster. That's a fact. <laughs> hey, oh, you know what? Watch this. You pay one guy, then you robbed eight guys to pay him. Is not a balanced cap. It's not a balanced cap. Okay. You can also, in there at 55 around there, in that third round, you can do DJ James, the kid from Auburn. I'd put him in that conversation. Do you take a line? Hey, do you draft the running back in this draft? Do you draft a running back? Would you draft a running back in this draft? Fourth round? I think you draft I think you draft a running back. What do you say, Tone? What round? Four? You use that one, you use that you maybe you parlay up four of those five, and then you go into the fourth. I'm not using a third. I'd like to use the line. Here's what I want to do: corner on 22. I'd like to use a linebacker at 50. An edge at 53. Another linebacker at in the third round. And with those fifth rounders, parlay two of them up to get another three. I want that kid Cooper at 64. I want that kid Edgerin Cooper at 64. From AM. I want that kid in Vic Fangio's and Vic Fangio's defense. I want him. 
Okay. To me, I think the best running backs in this draft in the top end here, I think they're Trey Benson, FSU, and they're Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks is going to be at the top end of the second round, though, or in the middle of the second round. He's a 59th rated player. So you go through top 32, you're getting into the second round, down to 40. That's the top eight. Then you go down a little more. So he's at the bottom end of the second round. And I don't believe they'll go second round. They may use that 53rd pick for him. Okay? They may do that. I like that kid, Jordan Hicks, safety, Washington. He's from Washington State, 118, his ranking is. That guy, J.R. Hey, that guy, J.R. Colson, that linebacker from Michigan, who was all over the field in the semi and the national championship game, he was spectacular. Would you draft a tight end? Frank Gore Jr. in the fifth? I think these other guys are better. Would you draft a tight end in this in this draft? Would you take a tight end? It's the kid from Michigan. You're not getting Bowers. Don't get ahead of yourselves. A.J. Barner, the kid from Michigan, ranked at 134. So he's probably fourth round. Something like that. That's an option for you. Because in my opinion, you've got to start looking at replacing Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard what has one more year or I'm replacing him. You know why? I can't count on him. Silsey's good. What does that have to do with being reliable? You can't keep telling me you're good and you show up for 75% of your games every year. You can't keep telling me that. That's not how you build a roster. MG, I think Cooper's an immediate starter too. I think he would be a force on that defense. Man, I'd like – and by the way, he's not being projected um, in the first round for whatever reason. I watched him play this year, and I happen to know the linebacker coach at AM, and I put him on every single All-American team I had. I thought he was – just a great football player. And I think he's going to make a massive impact. Remember that kid that you guys hated? That kid from Utah? What was his name? Lloyd? I said you should draft him. He's kind of like that kid. He's a good-looking football player, man. There's a kid from Old Miss, Cedric Johnson, edge, 174. That's going to be down in that five round. That's a value pick. Again, I'll show you. I don't know if I still have it, the value chart that Jimmy sent me. It's an ad, it's a draft value chart. Draft value chart, Jimmy Johnson. And I here it is. That's kind of what it looks like. What Jimmy did was he makes all the value picks based off of value and what that particular pick is going to bring. That's how he built the Cowboys. I wanted Lloyd in the in the first. I loved his game. He's killing it in Jacksonville. That's who I – you know, hey, Tony, you know who I wanted with those first two picks and everyone in here hated me? I wanted the kid McDuffie and Lloyd as my top two round guys. Oh, he's too small. The guy's now starting in the Super Bowl for his second Super Bowl in a row. Let me tell you something about being a gamer. And I mean being a gamer in a way where you just put your Sacagawea on the table. And you put that bad puppy out there every week for everyone to see and take shots at you. 
This is why I love the Philly Godfather, because you know what he does? Instead of put, see, I put takes up. You know what this guy puts up? He puts up his townhouse down on Madison Avenue. That's why this guy goes, and he know, you know that 65-foot yacht he's got sitting out in the port of San Diego? He puts that bitch out there, too, and he goes, C-Cells, you're a prognosticator, me. I'm a problem solver here. Sometimes you get the shells, sometimes you get the eggs. And this guy, most of the time, he gets the egg. Our good friend, Philly Godfather. How you doing, man? Good, man. Even a wise squirrel steps on his own nuts sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, 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 man. I'll tell you, I kept feeling for you too, man. You know what? Are you not in this position now? Get this. Mahomes is an underdog right now, also in the Super Bowl, and I'm doing this. I think I'm done with that. <laughs> Dude. Well, you know what's crazy about last week? I actually won more wagers than I lost, but I ended up losing money because I had some big money on Baltimore. But whoever came up with that game plan, whether it was Harbaugh, his offensive coordinator, I mean, what were they thinking? They ran the ball all season. They played bully ball. You're playing the Chiefs who have one of the worst run defenses in the NFL. And you decide to have Lamar drop back and pass the ball for 270 yards, fumble the ball, throw an interception, and, you know, what happened at the goal line, which was nuts because they were still in that game. And it was just the worst game plan I've ever seen from such a smart and talented head coach. It just boggled my mind. How have you done for the year, though? Oh, no, we're, we killed it. We killed it each and every year, man. We're booking the bookmaker. I tell people all the time, you know, you, you start getting booked from the day you're born, right? As soon as you get the Social Security number, you're getting booked. As soon as you buy health insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance, you're getting booked. You go to the sports book, you're getting booked because they have an edge over you. And that's why the insurance companies have the tallest buildings in every city because they're booking you. And that's why casinos in Vegas have the most beautiful casinos in the world. And I'm booking the bookmaker, and we make money each and every year. I tell people this all the time. They don't make castles out in the desert of Nevada at Las Vegas because they're losing. (laughs) Okay. The Vegas Strip isn't there because those dudes lose. All my friends are going because I lived there for six years. I lived right behind the Flamingo, by the way. I used to go in there all the time because those wives in there were really good to me. I would do my show from there. And they go like this to me. Don't bet on the Strip. This This is a little note. Bet at the Piggly Wigglies, the 7-Elevens, because, am I right, Philly Godfather, this is what the casinos do. They got that thing cranked up to like 67% failure rate. There's like a thing that if you put, if, like 70% of the time you're going to fail at the slots. Okay, and, if you, and over at the Piggly Wiggly, it's down to like 64. <laughs> so if you know, that's why well, when you go to Vegas, you don't play a five-deck blackjack game. You play a one-deck blackjack game because you're playing the odds. Hey, every time I go to the table, Godfather, I'm sitting there and I see a guy playing a five-deck blackjack. I'm like, God, your chances of winning against that guy are nowhere. Nowhere. I mean, the average guy's there to lose. That's why I tell people, if you're going to gamble, don't bet on any table games. Just go to the sports book. It's 52.4%. You got the better chance if you do your homework betting on sports then losing your money, betting on everything else. All right. I got a couple. Before I get to some of these prop bets at the Super Bowl, I got to ask you um, a question here about the great comedy hour that is known as the Philadelphia Eagles. They're at the uh, comedy store known as Novacare Center. You know, you know, I didn't know Philadelphia had like a comedy store. Then I realized that, oh, wait, it's the Novacare Center. So I, now that I know, <laughs> hey, that's, yeah, that's where Jim Carrey plays this Friday. He's over at the Novacare Center because it's like the new version of the comedy store. And the MC's Howie Roseman. Now, let me ask you this. <laughs> you got me laughing. Uh, will Kellen Moore, in your opinion, maximize Jalen Hurts' ability? Well, if you look at the odds makers' opinion, their odds to win the Super Bowl haven't moved since they picked up Fangio or, or more. Uh, people, you know, want to speculate and say Jalen Hurts is going to come back and have another MVP season. Well, you're speculating. I mean, I like to, you know, look for predictive indicators 
that helped me uh, form an opinion. And I can't say Jalen Hurts is going to come back to that MVP season. If you look at all his starts since he started uh, playing in the NFL, 60 65% mediocre, one good season. Um, now, if they lose Kelsey as their center, he's the second most important person on the football field. That's not my opinion. That's the sports book's opinion. Because if you see a starting center that's out of the game, you'll see the line move a point, point and a half. If you see a quarterback, starting quarterback not playing, you'll see that point spread move seven points. If you see anyone else not playing, that line doesn't even move. So if they lose Kelsey, who touches the ball in every possession, and we all know how big fumbles and turnovers are, you're in trouble. I heard some trade rumors about Patrick Sertain for A.J. Brown, and I'm thinking to myself, these people are nuts. There's like five A.J. Browns in the entire world. You're not going to find another A.J. You got him here. And when he doesn't play for the Eagles, their offensive production numbers, they dip so bad that they become a mediocre offense. You know what that tells me, though? Godfather hurts ain't the guy then. I don't want to say that because uh, he did show flashes of brilliance, you know, in that year he, they went to the Super Bowl. Even now, in the first half of the season this year, you could say it too a little bit. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't like what transpired, and people can say I'm lying or whatever. I don't like what I heard transpired in the locker room. Uh, and you saw it on the football field. He was getting decked sometimes, and you didn't see guys running over to pick him up. So there was a lot of that going on. Now, if he changes his attitude, maybe. I'm not sure. Like, But he's got skills, man. He's got skills. I just don't know if, uh, you know, Kellen Moore, you know, he likes to run a lot of motion more. And that's not what Jalen Hurts likes to, you know, likes to do. So uh, I hope. You know, he has a better season this year. I think the Eagles, you know, are headed in the right direction with the coordinators that they picked up, uh, that they hired. But at the end of the day, if you lose AJ Brown and Kelsey, now you got problems not only on the defensive side, but you got them on the offensive side. So how does that help Jalen Hurts at all? You need the horses. I heard Jeff Kerr from CBS Sports who covers the Eagles say this about Hertz and the Eagles themselves in the handling of Hertz. And by the way, I don't, I, I'm not saying it's attitude. I'm saying, I think this is a thing. They've made him less accessible to the media and to people. And even like, now I don't know if he's less accessible to his teammates. I don't think I read that into it. But he's less accessible to people being around him. And that's what Jeff Kerr says. It's just like he's not available to us. And well, he's not really that. available around a lot. And I'm thinking to myself, one of the formulas that Brady had that made him great was that he was completely accessible to his teammates. I mean, when he got to Tampa, this is a true story. I talked to Jason Light and Bruce Arians been on my program five times. And you know what he did? He got like all 90 of the camp names and their phone numbers. And he called them all personally. When he got into work the next day, when they're getting ready for their first day at camp, it was a free spread all on him. Kind of like a little picnic out back on one buck place. And Brady went around meeting everybody, even guys who would never make the team. And I thought that that right there, one of his secret gems is, is that he was maybe one of the greatest teammates of all time. Yeah, and then guys play their asses for you. And like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and nobody wanted to believe me, I said he isolated himself from a lot of the teammates, and that was information that was on the inside. Um, so, I mean, moving forward, he's got a lot of talent. But if you remember back in, in college, he was 20-2 and two as a starter, and they benched him. So huh. that don't make sense. You know, something's going on that – Hopefully, I mean, they, you know, they can rate the ship and they can get back on track, but the odds makers so far don't think so. And they back their opinion with hundreds of millions of dollars. They don't have the horses yet on defense. If you lose your center, man, that's huge. That's the people don't realize how big that is. It is. He's the quarterback you know, of your old line and he's the guy that sets the front and protection. It's huge. So uh, without him in there, you're, you, you think you struggled on blitzes. Oh. If Kelsey's not back, 
they may have to bribe Kelsey to come back with more money because to me, if you don't have Jason Kelsey coming back who had an all-pro season, you think you struggled on blitzes? You lose an all-pro Hall of Fame center? I'll show you that thing becoming a nightmare even bigger. Yeah, and, and go back and look at the Eagles' offensive production numbers without A.J. Brown. <laughs> you need him here. Like I said, there's only five A.J. Browns in the world, and you got him. Don't let him go. Explain this one to me. So all year long, Nick Siri liar <laughs> is telling us, hey, don't blame Brian Johnson. Don't blame Sean Desai. Don't blame these guys. Hey, that was my mistake in the Jets game. Hey, that was, I know it was my bad timeout. Don't blame – don't blame these guys. Well, how in the world did those guys get fired and he survived? He's a yes man, but he's on a short he's on a short rope. If they start the season two and three or two and four, he's going to be the first one that gets axed. How think about this though. How could you have a six sixty seven win percentage? Been to the playoffs three years in a row, and no one thinks you're a good coach. Hey. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. I mean, you just proved your own point. Dan. I know, I know. <laughs> <It's> crazy. <laughs> I know you, 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 you. When you say it, it's completely contradicting it. Yeah. I'm like, hey, how come this guy's on the hot seat? He's the number one coach going into next year on the hot seat. You got Belichick, maybe, or Vrabel waiting in the wings, and this guy has won almost seventy percent of his ball games. How come he's on the firing squad? You answered your question. <laughs> and the Eagles were 10 and 1 last year, but we all knew they weren't a 10 and 1 team. No, they were 1 and 7. <laughs> That's who they were. All right. Oh, by the way, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask you this one, man. Here, here's prop bets for this thing. If the Kansas City Chiefs win, does Travis Kelsey propose? To Taylor Swift after the game, if they win, what's the over under on that? <laughs> I would have already proposed to her with all that money. I mean, she's got a billion dollars. Million? She's got two billion. million in the bank. She's got billions, billions, billions. Right. And, and let me tell you how strong she is. And I, I was at Target buying a charger because I had to go up to Syracuse to revise some of the chapters in my book and edit some stuff with uh, my team. And there was a soccer mom there with, like, 12 teenage girls. And this is in South Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. And they were all wearing Kansas City Chiefs jerseys. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, what's going on here? And then I hear the one girl say, Baltimore Ravens who? And they all started cracking up. Taylor Swift has converted every teenage girl in this country into a Kansas City Chiefs fan. That's how strong she is. It's it's real. <laughs> Do you know that she has one of the highest selling jerseys? Like with her name in 87, whatever his number is, and her name on the back, Swift, on the back of that jersey, that they don't count it, but if they did, she'd have the highest selling jersey of any player in the league. She's so strong that I heard Deshaun Jackson, who's like, a real NFL player. Like, the guy played. He was, you know, and he said, he goes, you know, you got Mahomes, who's great. Andy Reid, who's great. But I think the NFL wants the Chiefs to win because of Taylor Swift. <laughs> and I'm yeah. thinking to myself, is this, what's he saying? Like, is that why they're in the Super Bowl? Like, wait, time out. How, you, how can you handicap that? You know? It's scary. I think she's going to be the Super Time Super Bowl halftime show next year. Well, listen, if you think the Chiefs win and you think this Taylor Swift stuff's real, well, then how do you not bet Travis Kelsey at 12 to 1 to win the MVP of the Super Bowl? <laughs> oh, let me that. get to the props now, then. If you're into conspiracy theories, you might as well bet, make that bet. <laughs> Holy cow. He has a strong. Well, hey, how about this? Better odds to win the MVP in the Super Bowl, Travis Kelsey or Patrick Mahomes, Brock Purdy or McCaffrey? Uh, Mahomes and Brock Purdy have the better odds. Because they're the quarterbacks. Sure. Yeah, and most of the time. I think 19 of the last 24 Super Bowls. But Bowl I like your thinking. Travis yeah. has a big game. And and they're, the other wide receivers, the other guys on that offense, 
They've been dropping balls all season. And Mahomes passing yards are at 259 and a half. Anytime he's thrown for over 259 and a half this season, the Chiefs are eight and one. Anytime that he's thrown for less, they're just five and five. So Kelsey's going to be huge here. That's the first one here. Mahomes, 260.5 in passing yards. You think he's over or under? He's going to have to be over for them to win the game. Uh, there's some real sharp money. The line originally opened up uh, three, San Fran minus three, and some sharp money jumped on that right away, plus three. It took the Chiefs plus three. Line moved back down to minus one, and then another sharp betting syndicate that bets millions of dollars, a lot more than I do. They took the 49ers minus one. So uh, if you believe the Chiefs are going to win this game, if you believe – the Taylor Swift conspiracy theories, then you got to bet over on Patrick Mahomes passing yards. Brock Purdy, 242.5 yards in this game in the Super Bowl, over under. Anytime he's thrown over 244 and a half uh, or 242 and a half, depending on, you know, I think the 49ers are 10 and 2 this year. But wow. anytime, yeah, uh, he, he's thrown for some big yards. But anytime he's played a team in the top 10 defense, you know, they, they lost the Ravens, they lost the Browns, and they beat a Cowboys defense that, you know, was a really top 10. Uh, so he struggled. Uh, but me personally, I think both quarterbacks throw for over their yardage in the Super Bowl. Christian McCaffrey, 49ers, 34 and a half receiving yards. Uh Man, he could break one. He could break one. That's not something I'm looking to bet for the Super Bowl because, you know, he might catch two passes and go for 40 yards. He's that type of player. And the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, they don't cover uh, running backs coming out the backfield on screen passes too well, and they can't stop the run. So, uh, man. Oh. And you know you want to use him. I mean, he's, yeah. he's the ultimate weapon. That's close. 34 and a half, you said? 34 and a half. That's from DraftKings, too. Yeah. Uh, I didn't bet it. But since he's he's the man that they need to come up big in this game. But he is he's a little banged up. Hopefully by Super Bowl he's completely healthy. If he's completely healthy, I say over. Travis Kelsey. 70 and a half receiving yards. <laughs> this Taylor Swift thing has my head all. <laughs> I'm dead serious, man. <laughs> it, it, hey, it's clouding your judgment here. Well, no, it's 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 not clouding my judgment. It's, you know, I know what I know. I know what I see. But you can't handicap that over here, you know? <laughs> you can't handicap. What's his yardage? 70 and a half. 70 and a half. It seems low for Kelsey. It does too. Game. I think I'll last year his receiving that. yards were like closer to 100. And he's been good. playing his best football these last two games. Yeah, but the but the 49ers do have a, a, a good pass defense. That's a great. They defense. got the linebackers that can cover him. Uh, that's low. I would say under. <laughs> don't make me, Jack. Dan, don't make me do this. Don't make. Me <laughs> <laughs> Debo Samuel, 57 and a half receiving yards. I'd say over. I like Debo, over. Christian McCaffrey, 89.5 yards rushing. 89 over. and a half. Over? Yeah, he's going to have 100 yards in this game. That run defense is bad for the Chiefs. That's why I don't know why the Ravens, what they run, nine times all game? Like, Dude, you can't win. Pat, hey, when I saw Lamar Tom Lamar Jackson have forty-seven passing attempts, it was over. What did it, what were they doing doing that? It did, I, I said last, last week. I said I'd rather him pass for a hundred and run for two hundred. I I what I what, and get this. Every, I don't know if there was a game this year that he had a number like that where he was in the forties like that no. for passing attempts. I'm like, what? It was either the worst game plan ever or, or Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Mahomes, 25 and a half rushing yards. He didn't get that many last week. I thought he'd go over. Uh, I 
I'd say over. San Francisco scoring over or under 24 points. It's tough. 24. Total is 47 and a half. Whew, that's right on the number. Um, they're in Vegas. I say over. Kansas City over under 23 and a half points. I say over. I think the game's going over. So you think this game's like a they're gonna score 24 21 game? I mean I could see a three point game, 30, 27. 27, 24. You know. Who do you have winning? It's tough. I, I like San Fran minus one. Uh, but I, I took some three early just as a numbers grab because it's a good number. You know, three is such a key number. I think my bigger position is going to be on San Fran. I haven't bet it yet, the bigger position for myself. Uh, but San Fran, it, it's so, like I said before, it's so hard to quantify greatness. And Patrick Mahomes is great. But San Fran's a better team. I mean, they are. They're the better team. You know what it is? Isn't this exactly like last year's Super Bowl, where Philly had the better team when it came to the roster? And there's Kansas City again with the better coach. Look, the coach is a Hall of Famer, and the quarterback's a Hall of Famer, the tight end's a Hall of Famer. And they're going into this Super Bowl with a better defense than they went into the Eagles Super Bowl with. And you got Spags. That's I mean, why That's why this game looks tougher for me when I look at it and I go, Kansas City's the underdog in this game? And yet they're better everywhere across the board. Like, when I – is Kyle Shanahan better than Andy Reid as a play caller? I would have to say no. Yeah. Is Patrick Mahomes better than Brock Purdy? Yeah. Are there more weapons in San Fran? Yes. But that didn't matter last year. That's why this game is hard, man. It's a, it's a very difficult game to handicap. And if you look at the Chiefs last week against you know one of the better defenses, they scored 17 points. They got shut out in the second half. And now you're going up against a defense that may be almost as good. But on the offensive side, San Fran's way better than Baltimore. They can run. They can pass. They got more weapons on the field. And listen, I've been talking smack about – you know, Brocky, Brock Purdy all year. But last week he showed me he's got the clutch gene in him. And that's something Lamar didn't have. Lamar choked. Purdy showed me something. That they came back from 24-7. That 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 was big to me. So, you know, you got a more you got a team that, that's great on offense and defense. You got so many weapons. This is such a tough game to handicap because of the greatness of Patrick Mahomes. Brock Purdy makes $870,000 a year. <laughs> Jalen Hurts next year will make that a week. Whew. There's going to be 20 quarterbacks that make the money he makes in a year and a week. Yeah. And, and this year. And they got 15, three more years of it. This year there was 15 quarterbacks with better numbers than Jalen Hurts. Think about that. Including Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield. Uh, Mayfield has better numbers. numbers. You see the greatness of Gardner Minshew made the Pro Bowl. <laughs> he had better numbers than Hurts. Oh. <laughs> it's a fact. Gardner Minshew had a better year than Jalen Hurts. This, this shit's yeah. classic. <laughs> San Francisco rushes as a team 135 and a half yards. That's a lot of yards. Uh, probably really don't love it. I can see them going over. Debo can run the ball a little bit. You got McCaffrey. Purdy showed that he 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 can run the ball when he has to. I say over. That that, that Chiefs rushing defense is bad. It's bad. That's the only weak point in the whole in the whole team is the rush defense. One last comment to you. Do you think Jalen Hurts next year and Kellen Moore? How about this? No, no. Here's here's the question I was going to ask you. Do you think Jalen Hurts gets a second fifty million dollar a year contract in Philly? No, but I think he plays better than he did this year with Kellen Moore. Okay. He can only get better uh, as long as they keep AJ Brown. If they can find a way to keep Kelsey, uh, 
you know, if they do that with Kellen Moore, yeah, he can have a better season. Now, if he doesn't with Kellen Moore, well, then you got to start, you know, yeah. weighing your options. To be honest, no doubt because then I want him to be. Successful. Hey, them hiring him put put hurts on the clock. Yeah, and none of that attitude. If it wasn't attitude, none of that. Oh, I don't want to do this. None of that. I'm isolating myself from other players. None of that infighting. You got real offensive coordinator. You got real defensive coordinator, and you got Sirianni. Obviously, we know what he is, but there's no excuses for Jalen Hurts next year. You know, you 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 uh, upset my <laughs> guy Tone because you said Gardner was you know a better and you know I mean no no he's not a better quarterback he had a better year it's a fact just look at his numbers that, that's all I said Tone man no, I didn't say he's the you know Tony he did miss the first four weeks <laughs> yeah. Mitch you didn't start the first four weeks and Jalen Hurts had a much better offensive line and a lot more weapons on offense and somehow. Mitch, you had better numbers on the year, so I don't know what kind of math that is. God. <laughs> Let me get the trash can. I, I, you know what, man? You've turned into a fire starter here. So, hey, tell people how they can find you, my good friend. <laughs> you can find me at Philly Godfather. You can stop by the phillygodfather.com. And, and the sign of a quarterback having a bad year is how many times he turned the ball over. Because as we all know, that's the difference between winning NFL games or losing them. So you can you can throw for four thousand yards if you turn the ball over 20, 25 times. Well, you know what? You didn't have the better season as a quarterback because your team didn't go nowhere. You lose a turnover battle one to nothing. You lose sixty seven percent of the time. You lose Good, Tone. You, you lose a turnover battle two to nothing. You lose the game eighty three percent of the time. Yeah. Look, see, <laughs> hey, look at look at you. How many turnovers in Look at look at Tone. <laughs> How many turnovers in Hurts have, Tom? That's all I want to know. Running the ball and passing the ball. <laughs> this yeah. is hilarious. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, Hold on for a second. Let me see. Vince, you had nine. Hold Running on for the a ball. second. We have another five fumbles running the ball. Hold on. Wait. He threw the ball in at least a hundred times more. Look at Tone, man. Hold on. Completions. He only had 50, 40 some odd more completions than what. But you, you want me to end this argument real quick? Yeah. The fact that we're even comparing it to, it's over. <laughs> the fact that we're even comparing these two guys, Tom, come on. This is hilarious. <laughs> Godfather, thank you so much, man. Hey, see, you got to remember something, man. You start messing around with Hurts, man. You're going to get you. You're gonna, you hey, you're going to be called out on it here because – Tone may be pissed off right now at the Eagles, but he's not at Jalen. <laughs> I want him to win, man. I'm the biggest Eagles fan in the world. And let me tell you something. Yeah, you sound 19, <laughs> 1980, as a kid, I cried when they lost to the Raiders. When McNabb was throwing up in a two-minute drill, I had money on the Eagles plus seven. I was happy they won, but I, I broke the TV oh, that year because I wanted a Super Bowl so bad. 2017, when – Dougie P and Nikki Foles brought it was like the happiest moment. And my, my kids were thrilled. I was happy. My mom was everybody, my wife, the whole Puerto Rican side, they were going crazy. The Greek side was going nuts. And I had it that year at 50 to 1 to win the Super Bowl before the season. That was like one of the happiest moments in our lives. Hold on. You're Puerto Rican and a Greek? No, I'm Greek. My wife's Puerto Rican. Okay. I was going to – boy, holy cow, that house must have a lot of conflict in it. They got a lot of great food. <laughs> I'll tell you that I sleep like this, though. I sleep with one eye open, Dan. Oh, you know, hey, no that. doubt, man. You know what? I told – hey, you should see – are you kidding me, man? My wife's one of those kind of chicks, man, where <laughs> – you know what, man? You say, hey, you say anything crazy, man. Believe me, I sleep with a patch on my eye. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep like this. I tell everyone this. You want to, I tell my good friend Tone here, hey, you want to really, you want to, you want to be fed well and loved. You marry a fat chick. You want to, you want to be miserable your whole life. You marry a great looking chick. And if you want to starve, you marry a great looking chick. That's where I'm at right now. I'm in purgatory. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna leave you with this. If 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 you want Jalen Hurts to have a great season next year, limit the low percentage passes down the field. More dink and dunk, more RPOs, more uh, higher completion, uh, you know, uh, percentage passes, 
and stop going for you know that that 40 50 yard bomb all the time i know you got you mean, AJ you mean Brown. play like Minshew more yeah this year yeah <laughs> <laughs> play smarter not harder man that's what it comes down to my man thank you so much good luck guys i'll see you next week you got it that's our good friend the philly godfather Don wasn't having he don't mind the disrespect on herds he would dis minds it when you drop Gardner Minshew. <laughs> that ain't Sills, that ain't working for me, man. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to, you know, because I run the whole thing here. You're just in the you're the caboose here. Okay. I'll run this thing here. That ain't we ain't going down that route. All right. Guys, you were great. Please hit the like button. Thank you so much. Xander Big Joe. Have a fabulous. NFL Super Bowl off week. Next week, it's going to be wall-to-wall Super Bowl stuff. We're going to have former MVPs on. Uh, Phil Simms going to step in with us. We're going to get Harry Carson. We're going to get so many people that played in Super Bowls that will be on. It'll be a theme next week. We appreciate everybody coming aboard. Two to six on Monday. Tone, thank you very much. Absolutely fabulous stuff. We so appreciate it. We will catch you on the flip side. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com.